AMC fires back on deaf ears and Wonder Woman 84 reviews start to pour out as we talk to Gary Tunnicliffe and more this morning on Midnight's Edge in the Morning. Good morning, afternoon, evening, whatever it is, where you is. Welcome to Midnight's Edge in the Morning. I'm Tom Connors. With me is the boss man, Andre. Greetings, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good night even, depending on where where you are. It is almost night where you are. And also with us is our resident script doctor. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Absolutely, absolutely. We got Gary coming in a little bit later, our good friend Gary Tunnicliffe, but for right now, we're going to chit-chat about a few things until he gets here. Isn't that right, Andre? Yes, indeed, because the big topic is, of course, uh, AMC is firing back at Warner and HBO Max for basically trying to kill the theaters, (laughs) although they won't admit it. Uh, But before then, we have a couple of other things to talk about, because we'll delay that until... Uh, until Mr. Tonicliffe is here, he has uh, he has a business meeting right now in this moment, uh, but he'll be here instantly afterwards. So before we get started, greetings to every single one of you in the chat. So glad that you decided to make us part of your day. So uh, greetings, absolutely everyone. And with that, with that, uh, we have some new footage from the upcoming Wonder Woman, which is going to be on HBO Max on December 25th. Oh, yeah, and then there's like this symbolic theatrical release at the same time. Uh, but we'll get back into that part of it later. Uh, but, um, but uh, yeah, this new footage of Wonder Woman. Have you seen it yet? And before we've seen that, we uh, we got a super chat from... Uh, Cesario JPN, who sent us $10 and says, I'd pay for HBO Max, but I want access to the material from 80s to the 90s as well. The softcore porn films, the sex documentaries, etc. But no to, but no to exit to Eden. Rosie O'Donnell in dominatrix gear shudders. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, uh, I I feel that I would have liked to have Rob here right now in this moment. But <laughs> well, I mean, what he's talking about is uh, a little while back here. Re- you know, in the recent political climate, uh, HBO and Cinemax dropped a lot of their uh, adult uh, fare. And uh, last I knew, a lot of it had even been dropped from all their streaming services. Uh, I think Real Sex was still on one of them for a while last I knew, but that was like years ago. Um, And I don't even know if they have that on any there anymore. So, yeah, they've gone, you know, completely uh, one-sided on that. But, you know, Fifty Shades of whatever the fuck is okay. Yeah, well, you never know. HBO might uh, release uh, another streaming service called HBO Blue for the blue movies and... There you they it. just you need know. to go all out and call it Skinamax. <laughs> they could, yeah. I mean, we've all called it that for years. It might as well be. Would be hilarious. Yeah, oh, yeah. Nope. yeah, yeah. No, like, uh, so yeah, like uh, HBO Max is not that bad. Actually, they got a lot of great stuff on there. It's a bit wonky, and you have the issues where AT and T has been running into. I think it was it uh, the Fire Stick or whatever. But I, or the Roku, one of the two, but I believe they are uh, working on that, and I think that was part of uh, this whole game was to push for that as well. Um, a cynical engineer says, "Did you hear about the legal letters from Legendary over the decision uh, for Godzilla vs Kong and Dune released to HBO Max?" No, I did not. I, I was, did, and that's one of the things uh, that we'll be discussing later. But uh, oh, nice. But, uh, uh, I want the uh, so, so basically like yeah like your Warner or AT and T made a decision we're gonna put all of this stuff on HBO Max, uh, but you have of course you have funding partners and everything. Well, what did and, I say? Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. So I fucking knew it. That's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, uh, so we're gonna really do a deep dive into that when when Gary is here, uh, because he is someone that has been predicting that something like this was gonna happen because the film production companies they or the studios 
they don't really want the theaters around. If they can cut them out and go straight to consumer, nothing will make them happier. They just have to adjust the budgets of the movies. The problem for them was that this happened now, when they have a year's worth of blockbusters still to release. Uh, if they just uh, get their, their budgets in order, they'll be very, very happy to kill off theaters uh, permanently. Uh, but before then, as we were saying, Wonder Woman, which does tie in to the whole uh, HBO Max thing. Now, there, there's there been like some new footage of, from it, including an action it. scene. Oh, you didn't see it. Okay, well, there's a new action scene. And uh, in my opinion... I'm one of those that actually have been somewhat looking forward to the movie. I'm like thinking like the movie's obviously going to have like some issues. It's all orange man bad all the time. Yeah. But it could be a fun movie in spite of that. After having seen some of these action scenes with like how exaggerated they are. I mean Imagine, imagine if you were to give Michael Burnham slow motion action scenes. Mm. That's kind of like what they are, what what they look like with uh, with Wonder Woman grabbing bullets with her lasso. What after after Steve Trevor, Trevor has seen them and is looking right at that bullet as it's coming? How? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, here's the thing. I woke up to a buttload of positive uh, Wonder Woman reviews, reviews from the uh, access media. Yeah, that's actually a bad sign. Yeah, and and again, this okay. Let me let me preface this by saying I've been getting a lot of Deadpool two vibes from this thing the whole time, and Andre knows what I'm talking about. But you guys out there, real quick, uh, we covered that film to death. Like we got early leaks on it and everything, and it got really spoiled real early on. And basically, by the time most of us saw the film, we didn't care for it. Um, now, I saw the extended cut later on. I thought it was a bit better than the other version. But regardless, we know we have a similar issue here. Going into this one, we know pretty much all the major story beats. And I keep getting the same kind of vibe. Like, I'm not going to enjoy this. Like, this is going to be a complete turn for the worse. And it may even be worse than what I felt with Deadpool 2. Because at least with Deadpool 2, it was fine as long as that damn kid wasn't on, on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't think we got that here. This just seems way too out there for me. Well, I, I, I also warned a lot of people. Uh, Dave Callahan, not a, I mean, in my opinion, he's not a very good writer. He doesn't have a great track record. He was on, on top of that. I mean, Jeff Johns also had his hand in this as well. Um. So you've got some things like within the foundation of the film working against it right at the start. Like no matter how much Patty Jenkins or Gal Gadot or the rest of the amazing crew that works on that film, you know, uh, try to fix it. Sometimes you just can't uh, keep that house standing before it comes crashing down. Right. And that was the thing was, you know, this thing went through a couple of reshoots. It got pushed back a couple of times. We heard about the test screening going very badly, um, which again, you know, doesn't mean anything because the first film had similar issues. And I'll admit the first two thirds of the film is great. That last third of the first movie though sucks. It mm -hmm. feels like it was shot on a, a freaking sound stage. Um, and I, I just, I don't know. I've been getting bad vibes from this movie from the start. And this is one of the last things one of my people that I used to know over at Warner brothers was telling me about was how this was a product of them trying to disconnect from the from the uh, connected universe, because um, everybody you know now that we're back on the Snyder train again, things are getting pushed back into the uh, you know we're gonna have a big you know multiverse. Well, before that, everything I kept hearing was they're getting away from the connected verse. They're just gonna start doing standalone movies. That was what the Batman was signifying. Wonder Woman eighty four was meant to be more of a soft reboot. Um, and that was kind of the, the word I kept hearing going forward was soft reboot. And they're going to get away from the whole connected universe tissue stuff. Yeah. They're know. going back to the old form, yeah. what they did in the nineties and late eighties with Superman and Batman. They weren't going to connect them, just make them their own properties and run it out that way. Yeah. Yeah. That was the, that yeah. was the plan prior to AT&T. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. And then AT&T changed that. And I think that's where I kept hearing that 80 wonder woman, 84 ran into issues and, I think that's where the, the test screenings and everything like that came out bad was because people were expecting a Wonder Woman 2. 
And this is not necessarily a direct sequel per se, from what I heard. It's more of kind of its own pastiche in a way. Only the only thing really connecting it is Steve Trevor in a weird way. And the the way they bring him in is so mystical, magical bullshit that it's like, uh, what what was that movie with, uh, uh, having can wait. Oh yeah. Warren Beatty. Yeah. Yeah. Same kind (laughs) of thing. He's in another body and she's the only one who can see him as Steve. Yeah, that's about it. That's, uh, that's, uh, about it. Uh, and uh, and also in this new footage, we got our first uh, first look at uh, Pedro Pascal as the as the villain. Oh, as Maxwell Lord, yeah, yeah, Maxwell yeah. Trump. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, uh, he was uh, he was obviously trying to look like uh, a very orange man who is very bad and very orange because he's bad. Women can't be superheroes, okay. <laughs> So and they can uh, have so, the yeah. last though. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then they had like this Ride the Lightning trailer today as well. And I was kind of looking forward a little bit to the to the movie a little bit before I saw the trailer today or the, the footage today. Uh and now I'm completely sold uh on or sold all stock in in that movie. Uh, As Stephen Otten says, I have no faith in Wonder Woman 84. It looks like a slow motion train wreck. Yeah, I agree. uh, It's not only that, but it looks like a car crash in slow motion, kind of. And uh, Insomniac's right here. It is is the monkey claw story, or the monkey paw story. Uh, That's what it is. Uh, Which is a good concept, but... I mean, you have to play it really, really well. It has to be all about the characters. And but it doesn't want. fit in the grounded, gritty Snyderverse. Yeah, there's that too. It, it, how do you work that in so you can buy it into it with what Zack Snyder did for those three movies, right? Like it, <laughs> or four, really, if you look at all together. Because yeah, oh yeah. Also, well, Suicide Squad is technically in his universe, so it is. Yeah. I mean, Iyer did have a bit more in that, and then of course, like all the weird production issues and the people upstairs having their own go at it. That was weird. I mean, yeah. personally, because of my involvement, I think it, the, the final product, if I had it, would have been a bit better, but not by a whole lot, just because of everything else that had gone wrong for a, for David Iyer. <laughs> and, and for your, for your sake, I didn't hate suicide squad. I'm, I'm one of the few people out there who's like, you know, yeah, I don't like Joker in it, but overall it was like, at that time, you got to remember it was the best of the DC films. It really was, yeah. <laughs> it was the be- better received. I mean, yeah, I, I get that, man. I it totally was do. The financially, most successful uh, all the way up until Aqua, or all the way up until Wonder Woman. Go figure. Yep. That that's very true. That is very yeah. true. And Chris Topher, yeah, this is something I was talking about last week. Mister H is saying Legendary Pictures is trying to prevent Dune and Godzilla from being shown on HBO, and that's what I was telling everybody. Um, was that they're they're supposed they were they were supposedly working the deal out with them, but evidently they didn't, and they jumped the gun. If this is the case, and I think we're going to get into this a little bit more later. I hate, I hate that we keep saying that, but uh, our guest should be here shortly. Um, but no, like that that's something I knew was going to be an issue was because legendary, and, and this is something I brought up from the very 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 start of this whole thing is you've got more than just one studio generally involved in this. You know, like there's. You know, there's production companies, there's um, licensees, and that's what's the things I was saying before about where they're going to have a hard time just dumping everything into streaming. And that's where this, I mean, I wasn't surprised. I knew Dune was going to get announced, and I know they were working on Godzilla and, and stuff like that. But when they said, oh, our whole 2021 sl- sl- slate is coming to HBO Max, that, that went right along with what my guy was saying, is that it had nothing to do with what was going on in the world and had everything to do with saving HBO Max. And I stand by that. I feel like even if theaters were open right now, they would probably do a similar move with Wonder Woman 84. It may not have been exactly the same, but it would have been more like what Andre was saying originally, was like a limited run in theaters, and then it would have went to HBO Max within like a few weeks. Like They would have totally taken advantage of that four-week yeah. window that that they worked out was universal and and they would have done everything they could to, to push HBO max, even if theaters were open right now. And that will get into our conversation later. So uh, Tiberius monk 84, a good friend of the channel sends in $5. Oh, Andre. 
Yes, he says, I'm rooting for Wonder Woman 84 to be good, but this gives me serious concerns, especially if it gives Deadpool 2 vibes. Great work, Midnight Edge, as always. Oh, well, thank you. So, yeah, we'll yeah. see about, uh, One, about yeah. uh, Wonder Woman. I certainly am much less excited for it now than I was 24 hours ago. Yeah, they, uh, DeWall sends in $10. Thank you so much. That's a, a new name. Uh, says they took a movie with 1984 in its title instead of making it against Marxism, socialism, they made it against capitalism and Orange Mad. That's a recipe for a flop. Um, yeah, uh, uh, that's uh, the irony, irony is a little recipe right yeah. there. I was gonna say the irony is a bit lost on him. I think. Yeah, it should have been about. It's, I would have done it like, okay, we're going to go against cronyism. You know, the the people that are abusing all the new things that Reagan is doing in power right now to you know, line their pockets, kind of like in Superman three, where Gus Gorman steals all the half cents in his computer in the, in the accounting firm. And then, you know, that kind of starts the plot of that film because that's kind of what it was based off of. The people movie. were taking advantage of, uh, of like a lot of little corporate loopholes that weren't crimes because no one thought about them yet. Like that's, that's what you have fun with, with the eighties. Cause that was the discovery of the new form of criminal activity and new form of doing business. And yeah, you, you could have really had gone gone somewhere with that but uh yeah they are going away going the way of like anti-capitalism stuff which is yeah. uh some of the the rumors well and that's yeah, what i've been wow. telling people is like everybody's like oh they're you know they're not gonna keep doing this they're gonna lose money it's like i've been saying it doesn't matter they don't care about the money right now it's all about this manufactured you know uh, bullshit po politicism anyway thank you for joining us gary welcome welcome yeah or rather nostradamus yeah a little <laughs> bit this. yeah i mean i heard part of it from my guy but i didn't expect the whole entire slate to be coming but uh yeah that really dropped a bomb on the industry welcome gary yeah, <laughs> yeah. um look you know i mean um uh, you know, look, I'm not here to gloat, and I didn't, I didn't say the death of c cinema all around. And I don't think theatrical releases will go away. But I, I, what I'd said for a while was, I think the theatrical experience will change. I think, you know, w what we're looking at is probably, again, a, a two-model scenario. I think in the future, which is probably going to be low, a low price option, super low. You know, like a, a cheap cinema experience where you can go and text, and people can sit on their phones and watch a movie while they're texting, which is if you have kids or no kids that how they watch movies these days or a high end Friday night, Saturday night experience where you go and have dinner and drinks and everything else. And, um, and I think, I think fundamentally for me, what really happened that caused this or was the force here of this was I think cinemas, AMC and all the, the big cinemas got greedy. They had it good for so long, you know, they were basically getting a, a huge percentage of the share of the profits of a movie for, basically just showing it that's all they were doing you know they were they were you know they were showing these movies and and they were taking a lot of money and they were also um, kind of like telling the studios what they couldn't couldn't do you know they were kind of saying you can't do this with your product and you can't do this and if you do that we won't show it and 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 I think they dropped the ball I think they were greedy and thirdly really importantly they didn't protect the cinema going experience they didn't enforce cell phones and not talking and all this kind of stuff and and that's what has to happen you know like if, if you're going to pay money and go to the cinema from now on you need it to be like uh, if you you know if you go to the amc um cinerama dome in um in hollywood you know somebody comes out at the beginning and they say look you're going to about to see interstellar christopher nolan movie this is the budget you know we're great film great director and we you know all cell phones are off and, and they need to have somebody in the room enforcing these rules so that if you do go to the cinema and spend money that, you know, you're not going to be next to some asshole who's going to ruin the whole experience for you. Because right now, when you go to the cinema, you know, in your heart, it's a 50 50 thing, whether it's going to be any good or not, or it's going to be ruined by somebody near you and being a dick. You know, we've all had it. It's not like nobody knows what I'm talking about. You've all had the jerk off who kicks your chair behind you or talks or cell phones or eats or God knows what's and ruins the whole thing. So, you know, cinemas drop the ball. Unfortunately, I'm sorry. I, I, I gotta, I gotta say one with one caveat that it's true up to a point. 
up to the last few years, the the studio has actually got a lot greedier, and especially Disney. But they deserve to, Tom. This is to a point, point, yes. But I actually know a theater owner who said specifically, this is why things went downhill. As soon as Disney started getting the bigger properties, they would start requiring 80 to 90% of the opening weekend box office. Right. And that's a big chunk of all the money that they would see. So you have a situation where, like last year, the the, the cinema had a they had a, a record year with forty two billion dollars in theaters, and a large chunk of that went into Disney's pocket right. instead of everywhere else. And so that's where the theater owners said they they couldn't afford to hire, you know, extra people to be able to you know kick people out when you have those issues. Right. They didn't have people come in to be able to clean like they used to. Um, you had the similar situation with staffing and all that kind of stuff, but no, again, I'm not saying you're wrong, but I'm saying that Disney did really kind of push this thing in the last few years. And again, Lucas was the first one to do it way back with the prequels. He was the first one to say, I want 75% of opening weekend. And everybody's like, "Ah, but he got it. And then he did the same thing again with Attack of the Clones. And ever since then, Disney's like, well, we can do that too. And they've done that with all the Marvel movies, all their big Disney movies that they've done in the last couple of years. And that's where the one, like, especially the smaller theater owners have said that Disney basically killed them. Like, they, they, they had no income. Like, yeah, you can pack the theaters, but when you're barely, you know, because not only do they only get, you know, 90% of the intake, the theater owners still had to pay for a rental of that movie. So, like, the lady was telling me nine times out of ten, whatever profit they make off of those screenings is just paying for the rental. So, Disney's actually getting, like, 100% of all their money was what she was complaining about. Now, that's specifically Disney. So, again, now i got to reiterate that. That's not the entire industry. So... I just think, unfortunately, the the day of the colossal, you know, huge 21 screener is... is, It's short-lived because I think think the reality is is that, um, unfortunately... And you can you can add this model to a lot of things like, you know, if you told me there was a blockbuster down the road tonight, I'd go down and just walk around and just to smell the smell of a blockbuster. You know what I mean? I enjoy going to blockbuster on a Friday night. It was a fun thing to do. You know, you go in, have a chat, have a look around. Tower Records. I miss Tower Records. I miss flicking through CDs, you know, and spending time in there and buying stuff. I do. But th- that's gone away. And uh, and I think cinema as we know it will go away. And, and you know, I think what we know is probably going to happen is, I mean, I think Stanky and Kalar, who were really the kind of like, you know, the the guys who kind of like were the ones who who made the decision regarding Warner Media and the attack there. Um, I think they've started the ball rolling. I think we know and probably expect that you know December the eleventh or before that we're going to see Disney roll out a twelve month plan that will be. Kingsman, Raya and the Last Dragon, you know, Cruella, Black Widow, uh, you know, Sha- and then Shang-Chi and, and then Little Mermaid at the end of the year. And as soon as any family sits there and says, hey, honey, you know, how much does it cost us to go to the cinema? You know, how much does it cost for me and you and the two kids? And if we buy popcorn, if it's if it's the cost of two cinema visits a year and we can get HBO Max or Disney Plus, and know that you're, I mean, if you get those two, if, if Disney do drop a, a bomb of a 12 month calendar, then if you invest in having Disney Plus and um, HR Max, you're going to be looking at a, a, you know, a top shelf release virtually every week. You know, or at least the, once a month, if not. Sorry? Or at least once a month, if not. HBO Max is, HBO Max right now, in their current calendar, it's a movie every three weeks. Yeah. And if you add HBO Plus to that, and if they roll out theirs, you'll be looking like that movie every two weeks or every other week. And whilst I, you know, still think, yeah, people will go, oh, well, I, I want to go to the cinema. I want to go to the cinema. That moment's going to come. You know it when it's like, hey, honey, we're going to the theater tonight, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to go and see Black Widow. Uh, have you got the kids ready? Did you get a babysitter? Uh, oh, it's a 45 minute drive. Do we have to get tickets? How close to the cinema are we going to be? Is it going to get ruined by some jerk? You know what? We can just stream it whenever we like (laughs) no no you're right about that aspect like the theaters have been they have not been updating like the alamo draft houses and stuff like that they they they're smart yeah they're gonna be fine and like i mean they can the theaters were kind of getting the idea with imaxes and a few other things and a few have been opening up a little bit more yeah if you get to me tomorrow in california hey i've got a little plot of land and uh you know it can have a hundred cars and I'm going to set up a little driving called the retro drive-in. And all we're going to play is, uh, you know, moves from the 60s and 70s. And we're going to do Friday night. We'll do, uh, you know, Rocky Horror Picture Show and stuff like that. 
and we're going to sell retro candy. Disney would not let it. you do that. Yeah, but, you know, you but you can. You can You can do a rental agreement for those kind of movies, you know, and screen those. But if you just did a little retro drive-in, I'd be like, you know what, I'll invest in that. But I think the, the AMCs and the uh, Pacific, you know, like I used to go to the Pacific uh, – Pacific Winnetka 21 screen, they're going to struggle. They're going to have a real hard time because you're just your rental and everything else is going to be so massive and, and it's going to fall away. I mean, I had this conversation a couple of years ago about Netflix and people's DVD collections. And I sat with a producer and he was like, I love my DVD collection. And I said, OK, let me ask you a question. I said, you have a DVD collection? He's like, I have a whole room of DVDs. And I said, so tell me something. When you want to watch a movie, do you get up and go to your DVD collection and then thumb through them all and pick them out and then go back to your DVD player and plug it in and watch it? I said, or do you just sit there like a, a, a mouse on a wheel clicking away at the, at, the, at the Netflix releases, just looking for something? And he was like, yeah, I get it. I was like, you don't have the energy to walk into another room and pick up a DVD. Never mind drive and if you're lucky enough to be five miles from a cinema, great. But if you're 35 miles from a cinema, 40 miles from a cinema, it's a it's a drive out. I mean, I was we were just at the local mall and we had to go and get a video game for someone for Christmas. And uh, we went past the TV section. I mean, Jesus Christ, the Sony new uh, whatever it is, you know, 75 inch, 80 screen, high definition. I mean, this thing's incredible in the screen, like the, the width of a, you know, a couple of pen, like a pen. It's insane. I mean, and my wife was like, who needs a cinema when you've got that? I was like, there you go, right? There you go. You get that and Disney Plus. I mean, and I think that's what HBO Max are advertising, aiming for. And I know there was some someone saying that, um, you know, uh, there's rumors of AT&T selling off Warner Media and, uh, and DC. But and they're saying, uh, you know, right now, HBO Max is only doing 8.7 million subscriptions. It's like, yeah, give it a couple of months, folks. And I think we're potentially going to see the most incredible amount of subscriptions because it's going to be a, uh, a stocking stuff for a, a hey, honey, I got your HBO Max for Christmas. Get ready to watch the next you know, 21 movies in the next 12 months. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because uh, that's kind of where, you know, my part of this came in. I, my guy was telling me that. Uh, that is what this has more to do with than anything. And even though this move will ostensibly kill the theater chains, again, I put chains in there for a reason because I'll get into that in a moment. Because you're right, about, Gary, that there's been a resurgence in drive-ins. Like I said, my local drive-in opened for the first cool. time in years. The, the the local cinema is open for the first time in years. Showing They showed like Freaky last week, and I don't know what they got this week. But yeah, they've got no problem showing anything that's on streaming. But that's the thing is the the, the chains won't, and that's why. They, they won't do that. But like my guy was telling me like this was going to happen one way or the other because this has everything to do with HBO Max. And we've... I've been doing some digging because we've been, you know, working on this for a while. And that's the thing is they only have 8.3 million active subscribers. Yep. They've got over 30 million that are inactive. That means there's 30 million people that have a free HBO Max account who aren't even using it. Right. And that's what this move was about is the fact that they're getting left in the dust by Disney. And that's what I was saying at the beginning of the show before you came in here. I have a feeling that even if theaters were open, they would have done something with Wonder Woman and some of their other bigger movies on HBO Max regardless because they have to do something no, I think, to get this I think back into the game. Didn't uh, didn't Stanky have a meeting with the uh, then head of HBO like a while back? Uh, and and the head of HBO, I can't think of his name is now, but he'd laid out a five-point uh, plan of what needed to happen and what he wanted them to do when Stanky was involved uh, at, at there, and he rejected it all. They went to H AT&T and then... AT&T bought HBO and now he's basically Im Im implemented all of those uh, directives to, uh, you know, because they know that that's where the future is. I mean, again, really what should have happened is that, uh, you know, and it couldn't happen. It's impossible. But what you would have what would have been the, the smart move, I guess, is that AMC and and, Pacific, and all the cinema change would have got together and said, look, guys, the future is subscribing. We need to create a online cinema experience you know, where we have a platform that allows all of the movie studios to come through us onto a streaming platform, you know, because that's where the future is. In the same way that, um, what's his name, figured out that, you know, Netflix was, wasn't going to work as a home delivery service model forever, you know, it needed to change with the times, and it did, you know, and at, at the time when Netflix started their thing, you know, they, they left Blockbuster in the dust. I mean, you know, Blockbuster were the company, 
you know, Netflix came along and did their from home service. Blockbuster then kind of tried to copy them, and and then Netflix did the streaming service and leaped that leapt ahead, and probably had to spend a great deal of money. Oh, to Blockbuster do fucked up. I was in the industry at that oh, time. Really? Blockbuster could have bought Netflix for a steal. Oh no, absolutely, and yeah, they screwed yeah. up big yeah. time. Um, well, I remember why because they didn't believe that people were going to get um, uh, dissuaded from having basically movie rooms, which are just filled with DVDs and VHS and Blu-rays. Because one of the things that Netflix took advantage of is, hey, you don't have to occupy a big portion of your home with all this storage of DVDs and movies. It's all in one place. And a lot of people are like thinking, you know what? That's a good idea because I've got I I knew friends that had rubber made bins filled with dvds and they had shelves and stacks and they basically had their own little mini blockbuster video in a part of their home like whether it be an apartment or house and it's like that's a lot of like space and some people like they're having families they need that space <laughs> so they figured yeah. yeah i could get rid of my movies still have them through netflix and be able to have a, a, a room for my newborn child <laughs> on that note on that note actually i read a report saying that uh, that the huge drop in sales in physical media was because people had run out of shelf space. They had basically bought the entire catalog. They hadn't, didn't have room for any more. That was a portion of it, yeah. Stopped, uh, that was part of the reason. And also, uh, Gary, I don't know if you've been formally introduced to a script doctor. No. Script doctor Gary, Gary script doctor. He's actually somebody who works in the industry, but he's incognito. Oh, it's I'm good. incognito, but I mean... I've heard your name thrown around a lot. I've seen tons of your films that you've worked on, sir. Uh, yeah, you're you're a wonderful man. You've got a great reputation around town, of course. <laughs> if I knew who you were, then I could say the same. I'm sure I could say the same. Maybe I'll figure right. out who you are sometime. He's a, he's well, a 15 year veteran of the industry, so um, chances are you probably do know who he is. You just I'd say he's dropped him. nuggets on things he's worked on here and there. But I'm yeah. sure we have the uh, 60 degrees of Kevin Bacon. I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, most likely, that. yes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, no, I mean, the, yeah. you're absolutely right. I mean, again, I the, the when I started to kind of get my tinglings about this was when I heard people having man caves and, and media rooms because, again, it was like the whole world is changing and and it was like you know I, I realized that you know when I heard of a media room, the only person I ever knew of that was like Elvis Presley with the, you know like a TV room and stuff. But then I started seeing these in friends' homes, and I'm not talking about people with giant amounts of money. I'm people talking about people who've converted their garages into you know cinema man caves with sideshow figures everywhere and movie posters and stuff like this and as soon as you realize they're creating their own cinema going experience of their ideal cinema you you knew it was a matter of time before it would happen i mean the funny thing about physical media i had a huge dvd collection that was all cataloged into books and everything else and what a pain in the ass you know kind of buying those things but i used to love doing it but now I routinely, I hate to admit it, I go on Prime Video and I sit there and I start buying movies. Now, I do have a caveat that, honestly, what I do is I've got a watch list. And if a movie's $15.99, I don't buy it. If it's $11.99, I don't buy it. But as soon as they hit $7.99, which most of them do at some point, if they're $7.99 or $4.99, I buy them. And every time I do this, I, I every time I buy a movie, and I've probably bought about 40 or 50 now, and I own the DVD copy in, upstairs, but I can't be bothered to go upstairs. It's easier for me to, to buy a brand new fucking copy. But I'm always, every time I buy a movie, I, I hear Tom Tommy Lee Jones in my ear uh, from Men in Black saying, I'm not buying the white album again. <laughs> Every time I'm like, oh, look, I'm buying the white album again, you know, uh, because every time they change the format, I end up buying a do it. So it's what it's done. Is, four uh, times, four times. I've yeah. It. It's made me really picky, though, about which movies I've got. No, so you're like, not. You're not totally wrong, Gary. And and again, I'm somebody who's a collector. So I, I, I've got a bigger physical media collection than most people out there. But I know that I'm not normal at the same time there is a bit of impetus for this like in, in, in we had a similar not exact same but a similar situation that kicked off the age of dvd in the home theater and that was if you check out our uh conversation with bill hunt from a few years back about the streaming wars we talk about how 9 11 kind of pushed that forward because people quit taking uh, vacations and they took that extra money and they put it into a home theater and that's what started building their dvd collections and then besides you know just you know netflix streaming all those kind of things coming along you also had 
three different formats at the same time on the market. You had DVD, Blu-ray, and 3D right. Blu-ray. And then later you had 4K Blu-ray actually added to the mix. So, like, that's another thing that happened is you just had a confusion on the market. Because there's people who don't even realize whether or not their Blu-ray player can play DVD still. You know, and then you got the gaming industry, which sometimes they have a disc, sometimes they don't have a disc player in it. And, and you know, for a while it was like Sony's big thing to push Blu-ray with the PS3, but ever since then they haven't really cared. And, and it's just kind of like that's, I think, what really pushed the industry for a while too was that PS2 had a DVD drive in it. No, I have to admit, when I got my, I just recently bought an Xbox, uh, you know, uh, a new Xbox, and uh, I was amazed to find that I could play my Region 1 DVDs in it, you know, so it was like, yeah, I can play my British stuff in it. But again, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I, I think I'm fairly active, but the truth is, if I'm lying on the couch, I will rather buy a movie that I own upstairs than actually go and than go and actually get it out of the case. I'm, that's how lazy I am, you know. And I consider myself to be a not a lazy person. But if it's a reasonable price, I'm like, you know, four ninety nine. I may as well own a digital copy. Fuck it, I'll do it. You know what yeah. I mean? So, um, yeah. it, I'm just saying. I just unfortunately, I just think the cinema going experience in the um, uh, Wally kind of. Uh, world that we're aiming towards you know people just being slovenly messes uh you know um it's just it's 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 gonna be too much effort to go to the cinema i think the cinema will be a you know what honey i'm taking you out tonight you know dress up and we're gonna go and have a really nice dinner meal in the cinema and watch a movie it'll be an experience or it'll be like i say a three dollar ticket make as much noise as you like text the hell your brains out and uh, watch a movie at the same time and it'll be a tween adventure you know what i mean well even at the current prices it's still a, an affordable date night in america like there's not a lot you can do on a, on a date night that doesn't cost you a fortune and a movie even though it is not cheap is still cheaper than going to a concert or going to something that's a little bit more expensive, especially if you're somebody who's on a budget. But yeah, but I, here's the thing, right? If you're a single guy who's on Tinder, then oh yeah, like, yeah, taking a girl out and taking her to a cinema, your your chances of getting what you really really want really double up when you say, hey, hun, hey, sweetheart, Netflix hey, and chill. Hey, yeah. Tinder day, I've got HBO Max and and Matrix is coming out tonight. You want to come over and check it out at my place? <laughs> oh yeah, Netflix and chill has become a thing for a reason and. RBA Feb, I don't or Peb, I don't know how to say this. I apologize, but also they do a really poor job with features on Blu-rays. Actually, uh, that's a whole nother stream or video that we've been working on in a while that we're going to talk to like Robert Meyer Burnett and a few other people about right. digital media and why special features have gone out the window. But that's a whole nother conversation. What, what we, need, we need HBO to re-implement all of the uh, all of the sort of saucy stuff they did a few years ago. You know, bring. Brick all that onto an, another channel so they can bring back uh, real sex and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, it's funny because people were asking about that before you come in. But we oh, do really? have some, yeah, we do have some super chats to get through. But talking about Blu-rays, though, I think that kind of really hits on this uh, article we have on the top here because you know the AMC theater is warning Warner Brothers that they will sacrifice studio profits. Well, we all know that on the on the front end, but I think the back end that that they're not thinking about is something we're talking about right here, and that is the secondary market. Uh, I think that this move will definitely kill the secondary market. Now, granted, Blu-rays and DVDs aren't a big deal as they used to be, but once you pay that, you know, thirty, forty dollars, or it's always on HBO Max for free, I'm never going to buy that Blu-ray or I'm never going to buy that DVD if I'm a, I'm a standard consumer. I think that's yeah, I one think, thing the studios think, aren't thinking about is, or even a streaming version of it if I already own it. I think I think uh, maybe I'm wrong here. I'd be interested to hear what other people think, but I constantly think. Um, there needs to be with all of the services where you can purchase, there needs to be a rental price, a per you know, a purchase price and a rental plus a fee for purchase. You know what I mean? So you can rent and buy or rent to buy, not a separate, you know, it should be a rent. Uh, See, with and a, I think that's where it's going to confuse consumers even more. Yeah. Like a least owned program. <laughs> and that's kind of what they already are. And that's what, you know, people were learning. And there's even, I think a, I don't know if it's a civil suit, but somebody's trying to sue Amazon right now. I think it's a personal suit, uh, saying. Oh that, yeah, when they don't own the movie, that type of thing. Yeah, I remember yeah, that. Yeah, basically, it's a long-term rental already, as it is on digital, and a lot of people don't realize that as well. Is yeah, you may have paid the same price that you would have for the Blu-ray to get the digital version, but if they lose their license, you're shit out of luck, and yeah. there's nothing they'll do about it. In fact, this has already happened to people, and they don't really do anything about it. They're like, oh, it's in our fine print. 
Yeah. I mean, I do think we're in a, uh, obviously we're in a state of flux. Uh, you know, we're, we're seeing so many changes and so many things. Are, I mean, it's kind of that's what kind of makes it exciting and kind of interesting is that there's a great deal of change and it's and it's all been um, it's all bottlenecked by coronavirus. I think you know it's kind of it's caused everything to happen uh, at a monumentally uh, accelerated rate. Right, and that's why I brought in 9/11 as an example. Is here we are in another similar situation where this has kind of pushed this ahead a lot farther than we thought it would. But think I, of the addition. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Gary. No, you go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, think of the, like, as you were arguing, think of the at-home convenience. I mean, yes, it's a cheap date night, but I, I mean, I've just had my one-year anniversary with my girlfriend. When we started dating, we wanted to go to places where we could talk to each other, and you can't do that in a movie theater. So we ended up going to, like, um, cafes and, and shops that actually had, like, board games and video games, stuff that you could talk with people in, in public without it interfering other people's times. But now that you have this streaming services that are populating up from various studios, you now have the ability to talk with your significant other, other during the movie and you're not going to miss anything because you can always pause and rewind to see what you missed if you end up you know, getting taken away with the conversation. And right. I think people are going to actually really resonate with that because now they're not having to go to the movie theater and then miss a whole chunk and then ask someone else, hey, what did I miss while I was talking to my, my date? <laughs> they right. can just say, we can rewind back to the last thing that we remember and then pick up where we went off with that movie and it's not going to cost us another ticket. It's just only going to cost us maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half hour, maybe a wow. day if <laughs> the conversation really went off the rails and they're not out anything financially. Yeah. Or the last 45 minutes you miss because, because things get hot and heavy and you decide yeah. to. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's also another strong argument for, for not going to theaters. Uh, but guys, uh, to, I have two questions for, for you um, professionals within the industry. Uh, one relating to, uh, to theaters striking back and the other relating to fellow um production partners striking back we'll get to both of those in turn but first we have a couple of super chats to to catch up with uh mr tickle trunk sent uh, a super sticker of a cute little kitty or something like that for it's a puppy for her heart, thanks so that's much. what i say yeah and uh, nelson Sheretta says for five dollars short term this makes sense long term if they kill theaters they kill a big income stream yeah. They kill the one billion dollar movie. Yeah, that they do, but all they have to do is basically just adjust the production budget to a point where they'll still be um, profitable but, and but go long term. Go a long wild form. drinker it's has appeared. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. But let me, uh, what I was going to say was, yeah, we might see the death of the the one billion movie, but the studio's amount that they still recoup will probably be the same. Do you know what I mean? Uh, they don't, you know, what they will get over the long term is, again, it's like the whole Skyfall, um, you know, bidding amount. You know, technically, you know, Barbara could have sold that movie for the amount they were offering and, and walked away with a profit. And it's like, oh, but she would have made this. It's like, yeah, but how much of that would have gone to the cinemas anyway? And how much would you have to spend on and, on publicity and advertising as well? It's like you could have probably walked away with $60 million profit there and paid everyone off and done very, very well out of it. I think, again, it's going to come down to number crunchers who say, yeah, it's the death of the one billion movie, but we never saw one billion. We were giving away forty percent of that, so we were only ever seeing six hundred million. Uh, you know, so that's really the the number we have to hit. You know, um, I think the whole model has changed in terms of you know the old thing used to be we have to do three times the budget. That has to be the number to make a profit, and then we're into the gravy scenario. I think that's going to change once you cut out the middleman. Absolutely. And, and to further to the critical drinker's point, I kind of agree that the situation compels you to stare at the screen, but it, ultimately it is up to the quality of the movie to demand your attention. And what if did, someone just... What, it, what did he say? I didn't see it. What did the critical drinker say? Oh, that um, movie theaters come, kind of force the audience to pay attention and not have to talk to, with each other, which in, in the atmosphere of things I would agree with. But again, if the movie itself doesn't have the quality on there to compel the audience to actually be invested into it, it's it's kind of like shooting shooting crap <laughs> craps at this point you're but yeah uh, see but studios aren't learning anything because what happened last year's script they had their biggest <laughs> year ever and some of the worst movies ever came out <laughs> like, like arguably there was there's was some of the well, some of the temples are not that great yeah some that's of what i'm saying like yeah great. like i mean my my favorite movie of last year was once upon a time in hollywood I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, that's whatever, but like normally, you know, the big movie of my year should be something like a, a superhero movie or something like that. Cause I'm a genre fan. Don't get me wrong. You know, I love Tarantino, but 
you've seen my movie list. He he makes the top ten every year, but how often is he number one? Only with like what was it Pulp Fiction? I think. <laughs> so, yeah. But script. Let me ask you a question. Script. Yes. Go right ahead. Sorry. You, you know, you're in the industry, right? So you're like me. So you've been to the DGA and had screenings there, and you've been to the DGA and seen uh, you know screenings of movies or you know stuff like that. I mean, and you know what the atmosphere is like when you do that. That's how I want the cinema experience to be. Yes. Where literally you cannot hear a fucking pin drop for the two hours that the movie's on. People, it's it's like um, it's like it's just the well, sound. It's like a high school auditorium. <laughs> sound is usually three times as loud. The mm -hmm. DP has usually come in and corrected the color for it. You know, I remember seeing heat in there and walking out with my ears ringing. You know, with Michael Mann, you know, I mean, and my ears were just ringing. I was, when I saw uh, Gone Girl with Fincher, you know, actually David was only actually there for the first minute, I think, and then left. But, I mean, not a single word was said during that movie. Apart, actually, the killing scene that I was involved in, the threat, there was one person, I think someone's wife, who literally freaked out. But that was the only noise you heard. And that is how it should be seen in a big screen, is people, I've never understood it. I can't understand it. I just want to say to these people, look, You've paid 15 bucks as well, right? So why don't you shut the fuck up? You know, yep. why, why are you in here talking? Or it's 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 10 o'clock at night and we're watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre and you've brought a baby with you? You know, I mean, <laughs> why did they let this person in? And for Christ's sake, with a stroller? I'm sorry, but cinemas needed to protect that and make it so that there was a reason I wanted to go to the cinema. The only cinema I've been to in recent years and the two cinemas I used to go to in LA all the time were the, the, the Dome or I'd go to Pasadena to IPIC, which was a $60 ticket. I mean, and it was fantastic, you know. I didn't want to go and see a movie at a, a multi-screen because, sorry, but people were just making noise and being uh, inconsiderate, you know. And like no, treating I agree, them, yeah. They, they think they're in their lounge and they can behave, behave like they're in their lounge. Right. Well, yeah, the protocol has completely just vanished pretty yeah. much over the years. Like, because yeah. that's why I compared it to a high school auditorium. When I was in high school, and may, maybe this is my personal experience, but we had teachers that said you had to put your hand up and then shut up, and if you didn't, you were ejected <laughs> out. And that's just how it was. And, and that's when, when, when I, you know, when I got to see my first little um, premiere as a guest, it was like, yeah, don't say a thing. You say anything, you're, <laughs> you're going to be upsetting people. So that's, and I was like, yeah, I'm fine with that. But to the point is like, we don't have that here. And, and that's what reminded me of like, the only time I've ever been in a public theater or sorry, a cinema where the audience didn't say anything at all is when the movie was like phenomenal. Like when I first saw um, uh, Inception, like that was a dead silent film. And that's just because like within the first 15 minutes you are hooked and everybody was just like, okay, our attention is done. And that's where it is. And that's where, to the benefit of the film. But when you go into a movie, like one of the last movies I saw, sadly, was Charlie's Angels. Pretty much a scare theater, but everybody was talking. And, and like, because nobody cared because the movie just didn't do the job it needed to, which was compel your attention. See, I think I think with when it comes to Nolan, I think it's a situation like this. Boyfriends go with their girlfriends. This is going to sound so sexy. It's now what I'm about to say. I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> I think, I think before they go in, there's a pact made. The boyfriend's going, look, I'm going to explain to you what it's about, but I need to concentrate, so shut up, okay? <laughs> so gonna, so just, just let me watch it, and then I'll explain to you, you know? Or maybe the girl <laughs> saying the same thing to the dumb boyfriend, like, look, I'll, I'll figure it out, but I'll tell you when we leave, not during, so shh, you know? No, no, that's a great point, but see, that's the thing, is you can't... Said that the cinemas demand that you concentrate on their movies. Exactly. Nolan's the one who demands that you focus yeah. on Exactly, them. yeah. <laughs> well, I, but that's just... Uh, that's just a common courtesy thing I think that's went out the window over the years where people have forgotten that, you know, going to the theater is something, you know, you, you respect everybody in the theater, you respect the movie itself, you keep your mouth shut unless you're laughing or crying or whatever, you know, when you're supposed to during the film. And that is the way you're supposed to be. That's the way I was raised. I think it's a generational thing. I think it's the same as what yeah. happened, saw happen in theater. I think, you know, anyone who went to Broadway, the West End, you know that in the 1960s, 70s, and the 80s, when you went to the theater production, you know, people dressed up. They wore a suit and a jacket and tie, or, you know, you know, they're dressed up for the evening. Now you go and it's people in uh, shorts and loafers and T-shirts, you know, and uh, I'm not suggesting that people should dress up for the cinema, but it was a, it was a night out. and it's No, it's totally. When I was a kid, and again, my fond memories of cinema when I was a kid, you know, I mean, it was a hallowed place, you know, I mean, it was a wonderful, fantastic experience, you know, and it was always a wonderful 
fantastic world that beckoned me from the screen, you know, a, a world I couldn't believe. But so, and this was in Cannock, you know, in, in England. So um, it was a rarity and a cherished experience. And I mean, and I, and I was a talker. Even as a child, I was a chatterbox. So, I mean, I would I would sort of look, be chatting away. And my, my, the worst experience I ever had as a child was going into a cinema, walking down the thing and going and sitting in a chair and realising that my family had gone and sat somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> I turned you, around, they'd all gone somewhere else. I was like, we're not sitting with you because you talk, you know. And you really I was just going to say, we used to, well, that's for that specific reason. I mean, we used to sit away from our parents when we were kids just because. You know, we didn't want to sit next to our parents. <laughs> But no, that's that's some great points, and I think again, like that goes more with just I think a generational thing where people just need to learn to shut the fuck up. And you're right, like theater itself, not not movie theater, but you know, like theater theater used to be more respected too. It's become almost like this obnoxious Branson, Missouri kind of thing, to where it's all about getting as many butts in the seats. And like you said, it's not about who's in the seat. Like it used to be more like you know, we're going to the theater. You're going to shut up. You're going to see these people put on a play, and you're going to respect the 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 people doing it because that's you know they're doing this and you're going to keep your mouth shut you know and it's the same thing i think should extend to movie theaters and that's something that unfortunately that the studios have nothing to do with outside of their movies being crap maybe that's why i that's yeah. why i think one of the uh one of the options has to be literally a you know mcdonald's play area version of a theater where it's just like anything goes you can do anything and and you drop your yeah. kids off and they go in there watch a movie and you know they're in a dark room in their fairly safety but I mean, I don't have children myself, but we have niece, nephews and nieces. And when they come over and we, we have a pretty elaborate media set up here, but they sit there and I mean, and, you know, I can't imagine it, but they are literally on a movie. They're watching a movie, watching a movie, you know, at the same time, you know. Uh, so you have to basically say, look, that's what they want to do. So we have to create an environment where they can do that. And if it's a three dollar ticket and you fill the room up with kids on a Saturday after evening and parents can drop them off and leave them to it. Then fine. Would I want to go in there and watch the movie with them? Uh -uh, you know, but yeah, but I think well, we the got... other thing that's, Oh, sorry, Tom, go right ahead. No, finish up. But I was just going to say, I think we got to get back to the super chats here. But yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. I, I just wanted to bring this one thing up with regards to comparisons of like stage theater and movie theater. I think if the movie theaters, the actors that are on the screen could turn around and tell the audience to shut up when they're talking, that would actually change the entire dynamic. Cause that's what you had the risk of when you went to actual live theaters that the actors might get really upset and then point you out, embarrass you, eject you from the theater and then continue on with the show and improvise like, Oh, that's weird. Like the gods from above were like, yelling at us or something <laughs> like you can't do that with, with cinema, because again, it's all been shot in the past. It's edited. It's not a live interaction. But I tell you, if there's at one point a movie where they just broke the fourth wall and said, you in the fourth row, turn off your phone and be quiet. And then went back to right. things. I think script doctor, what every director should do now with every lead actor is they should just do a shot of them saying, shut up, listen to the movie, put it onto, <laughs> a, reel, put it onto a reel and have it as a They kind of do yeah. already though, Gary, like they have these little bits in the beginning of the movies where- No, no, like, no. What I'm saying is that should like be- Like in the middle. <laughs> no, I know what you mean, yeah. They should have it loaded up on a second projector in the thing so they can just drop it in, you know, like in the mid movie. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they, should the do, they should do as you have like in like in some venues and like uh, not theaters but like water parks and stuff like that where where they film the audience and they zoom in on people and they add like some text on the screen and everything like that stop the movie in the middle and then zoom in the people talking and humiliate in the text and have like the director say shut the hell up or something like that yeah, yeah except the yeah, first person that happens to they do. Until tom cruise yeah. told me to be quiet <laughs> i think the simple reality is is you do what like i say you've seen movies at the dome uh, scripts i'm sure you know and somebody comes out at the beginning and they say look you're all here for the same reason you've come to see the movie we want all your cell phones off they basically just do a, a nice little you know it's almost like the manager of the cinema comes out and talks to you Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and just says, uh, you know, shock chair. It's very nice. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I like that. Um, you know, comes out and basically appeals to the good sense of you. And usually at that place, anyway, you, you're getting cinema goers, I mean, and cinema make, movie makers. Um, but, I mean, I think that helps is that there's a connection that somebody actually comes out. And I think the audience then know that there's somebody who's actually going to physically, um, you know, potentially, uh, you know, enforce that law. So they basically come out and say, look, you're here to watch the movie. You know, you all want to watch it and hear it and see it clearly, you know, without any distractions. So we're asking you all to turn your cell phones off right now. You know, no calls. If you need to take a call urgently, if you think you have to leave the cinema, uh, you know, and if you and if we do discover you doing that, we will ask you to leave. So that's what they do at the beginning of every movie. And 
as far as my experience has been there, it's always been a, a very good cinema experience. So much so that you could you could you had to get tickets, and it was the one place recently where you had to uh, you know it was assigned seating, which yep. is rare these days. Yeah. yeah. Let's uh, get back to some super chats yes. before we get into the questions that I have for yes. the for our two insiders on the panel. Uh, Willie Woodwood says, "Hello, Midnight Said Script and Gary." So yeah, hello, Willie and everyone in the chat. And Warmaster says, "For ten dollars, thank you so much." I'm still annoyed. Theaters keep burning my popcorn. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, there you go. And Fat Steven Seagal beat up Ryan Johnson, says, for two Canadian dollars. I punched Ryan Johnson today. My hand smells gross. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, he has it coming, I'm sure. And Mr. Tickle Trunk uh, says, uh, for five Canadian dollars, with the increase in innovation and decrease in cost for audio and video toys, this was going to happen anyway. We're just there faster. And on a related uh, note, Stubble McShave sends us uh, 20 Swedish krona saying, some theaters may survive, but it will kill IMAX. And Loki's Mornings of Mischief says, I've got totes in storage full of DVDs and Blu-rays. I won't sell my physical media. No, you keep that. And Stephen Otten says, Every time format, every time formats change, I buy Blade Runner. <laughs> God, I don't know how many versions of that yeah. I have. And Hellraiser. <laughs> yeah, I've got a few Hellraisers. Yeah, yeah. Um, like me and Gary, we have a pretty decent Hellraiser collection, don't we? Hellraiser. No, I never heard of it. But yeah, for some reason, I think Seven is the only one I can't get on Blu-ray because it's only in print once. Uh, I think it was Seven, whichever one it is. Yeah. Yeah, uh, deader, you mean, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, no, the, the one with the, the female uh, investigator in it. Yeah, yeah that's deader. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the only one I can't get my hands on for. Like, I'm not going to spend the amount of money that people want on eBay yeah. for it. Sorry. She, uh, she was so great. I was so happy when she was in Hell. It's a decent film, but I, I can wait till it, they re-release it at some point. Co-produced by Stan Winston, the legendary Stan. Winston. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got it on great. DVD for now. That's enough. Me too, Reggie. For, why yeah. is why is that one, Gary? Why is that one the only one that hasn't been re-released a dozen times on Blu-ray? Uh, to quote Scooby Doo once again, <laughs> I, it's got to be some kind of rights issue, I would imagine, because yeah. What are you a rights issue? I think it was a packaging issue that they uh, I licensed don't... it up to someone because, like, you have like several of them being like uh, with like it two. It may be a rights issue. It may be. It may be a rights issue because that one, oddly enough, if see that was a pro a product that was owned by Stan Winston. And several That's what people. I was wondering because he does yeah. Yeah. time as a as a as a, as a individual project is just deader before it got slated into the Hellraiser. Yeah, just, maybe there was some kind of weird paperwork that uh, it's never been released in the U.S. to my knowledge on Blu-ray only overseas. Yeah, I could be I wrong, but I bet there's some kind of weird finicky thing about that that uh you know they, they're not they can't and I've another one of stan winston's movies he's got a big connection with a gnome named norm has never been released over here hardly ever either what a shame eh? oh, no name norm yeah well it's actually not that bad of a movie i mean it's it is what it is but the effects are really good it's stan winston effects that's why they're good but yeah i think stan actually was a uh, a massively underestimated director and probably could have gone on to have a very very uh substantial directing career Pumpkinhead's excellent you know it's really really good holds up well and uh and then he did the ghosts video for michael jackson he clearly had a knack for it and was a great uh crew uh, runner so i mean uh, i think he could have gone on to a stellar career as a director yeah yeah he directed the gnome named norm too yeah yeah absolutely yeah. But yeah, yeah, I think that's got to be why because I, yeah, I'm not paying Probably. 60, 70 bucks for it or 80 bucks or whatever people want for it right now. I would imagine that's the reason. Yeah. Probably, probably. All right, let's uh, let's get back to to the super chats. The Wall uh, sent us uh, two super chats back to back. First one for ten dollars. Thank you so much. Uh, saying they've been doing this in literature better part of uh, of decade and a half now. I have a huge hard copy book collection, and I have thought about it, and I haven't purchased a book physically in two years. 
and uh, the wall also says for for twenty dollars thank you so much that's how we keep the lights on here real problem one they're already doing with digital book collections that is editing things in your digital library. They have already discussed doing this with movies, and I have found them doing it with my book collection. Oh, they have yeah, already started doing it with movies. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, again, like when, when you when you buy and you have your own library, it's not actually yours. It's the, the, that you rent a standard product. And if they decide to change that standard product that you've rented, no matter if it's for the long term, they'll change it right there in your own library or whatever it's called. And they can do that. That's in the fine print. I so if you want something you can change, then uh, go physical uh, or have your own digital library. I mean, this all sounds very similar to the, I mean, the last kind of time I remember this kind of discussion was like, you know, the classic kind of the adjusted Star Wars, you know, original trilogy being changed and no one being able yeah. to get the originals and that kind of thing. So this has been going on and, and will go on forever, I assume, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, it's funny, though, because you always had like this thing when 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 they changed the ET and everything. They're like, ah, do, 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 like don't freak out about it. No one is going to come home and change the DVD already have but with with streaming that's kind of exactly what happens because you don't have it at home you have it in the library and they can change it right there yeah that's true the, let's just, just hope they don't pull a video nasties on us <laughs> and it becomes a contraband that would be a bad thing yeah 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 indeed indeed uh, and moving on we are soon caught up marky vicky says being all digital is nice, but the problem is if the left brigade decides to cancel one of the movies, they can. Your own physical media. Pretty much what is I just canceled. said, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And Roger Haynes says, you know what I prefer? Having a choice between theater and streaming. Of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Stephen Otten says, I agree with Tom. Uh, oh, you. Once Upon a Time, Once upon in, a time in Hollywood was my favorite movie last year as well. Yeah, I just had to stop. And the same year Endgame came out, mind you. That's why, you know, that was kind of my whole point is like we had a big, huge event movie, but yet the Tarantino movie, and it's it's a great Tarantino movie, but it's probably what in his bottom five, not his top five. I would and say it's so, my, yeah. Yeah, my favorite movie of last year. That That's my point with it. You know, it's like, okay, that, that that's, there's something off here. Yeah. And uh, Brett Cohen says, with all the tech we have, I'm surprised cinemas don't have cell phone blocking tech in place they to push sued. them out of the cinema. Yeah, exactly. They can't do that. Like, imagine if you need to dial 911 or something. So or someone needs can't to get a hold of you for an emergency. Yeah. 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 And uh, Bogue uh, says, for 50 Mexican dollars, thank you so much, that's exactly what we need. A movie star telling us to shut shut up in the middle of the movie. They should also tell us how to vote while they're at it. <laughs> well, instead of putting all that energy and telling us how to how to vote, maybe they should be doing that. No, I mean we already got the minions in the beginning of the movie telling us to shut up. That's what I was talking about with Gary. But it's like no, nah, I'm. They should bring somebody else brought it up. They should bring back the intermission. And then in the intermission, that gives people, A, the chance to, you know, murmur and talk and go to the bathroom and do their thing and then get that out of their system, perhaps, you maybe. Flow. Yeah. You lose the flow of the movie. You know? I don't know. Yeah. I've never had an issue with intermissions as a kid. We used to have them all the time. Yeah. Unless it's ending uh, on a uh, cliffhanger where yeah. you can actually, like, tease them for that 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> we have a two more well, super chat to run through, yeah. and then I want to get into the questions. So Spider Unlimited says... The problem is the generation of viewers today as well. You can call them out for texting, and they will fight back and be offended right in the middle. People get yeah. shot and stabbed over that shit. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. And Dirty Soul Monkey says, I used to be a projectionist. My manager would tell me to stop the movie and raise house lights if anyone refused to be quiet and then kick them out. Yeah, wow. see, there you go. Wow. And with that, uh, we are all caught up on on super chat almost at least uh but we'll we'll get to, back to the remaining ones afterwards uh because uh warner and at&t and hbo max they're getting some level of pushback and the first pushback actually comes from amc theaters 
who, for anyone wondering about the uh, about the thumbnail, yes, they are majority China owned. Check out that video. Yeah, do check out that video. I'll we'll link to that in the description. Sex, it's our own and murder. <laughs> it's it's our. <laughs> It's our own, uh, like, um, uh, what's the name of like that cat dude again? Tiger King. It's our own yeah. Tiger King. <laughs> so it's so Fucking pound of it... flesh in that bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes off the rails real fast. So everyone check out our Tiger King, a.k.a. our History of Asa AMC Theaters video. I got to say anyway. this, though, Andre, before you jump into this. The, 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 the guy who's, uh, what's his name here? Uh whoever the head of AMC is, he sounds like such a moron because he's saying exactly what I've been saying. And he's like, well, if they do this, they're sacrificing all their profits. It's like, duh, they know for their streaming service. It's like, duh, that's exactly what they're doing. That's what I've been saying they're going to do. They don't care right now. They don't care about the profits. They, they see more profit in the future of HBO Max than they do in theaters. They're going to they change the model. They're going to yeah. starve you out and they have bigger pockets than they can afford to do it. They're going to starve you out. And yeah. they're going to use this to change the model of how they make movies so that they can re get in more money on the streaming side of things, which is something producers have been desperate for since the uh, the big blockbuster superhero fi things. They just want those budgets down so that they can make more profit. But anyway, yeah, your but question. Yeah. If you, yes. If you were here, uh, when I had the horrible revelation, I you know it, it was on air that I kind of had the revelation with with Andre and Tom. I you know we were talking about this whole thing, and I said. You know, the, the scary thing is if someone is sitting in an office somewhere and someone says, you know, so right now we release a movie through the cinemas, you know, onto the screens. How about if we just cut them out? And someone, you know, someone says, what are you talking about, Bob? And I'm saying, you know, Bob says, uh, I'm talking about killing theaters. Well, how do we do that? We release all our movies on streaming, but we won't make, make any money. Money, But yeah, but we'll we'll kill cinema. It will destroy them. We'll starve them, and we won't give them anything. They'll have no product, and they'll die. And then when they've gone, we only, you know, it's like that's the only place you can see a movie. Right now, people do have choices. We will take away their choice by letting them just, they'll die off. They'll wither and die if we cut off their food supply. And right. that was the kind of horrible discussion that I imagine might be going on in a room with someone like Stanky and Kalar. You know, yep. it's like they won't survive. Indeed, and that brings us to uh, to my question because in the article, uh, because here you basically have the uh, uh, Aaron, who is the CEO of AMC, and he's of course throwing a hissy fit, saying that they're doing this just to promote uh, HBO Max. Well, Dude. duh. <laughs> and then he also he added that. <laughs> Can I do it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, go for it. I fucking knew it. <laughs> I knew Gary would like that one. <laughs> Speaking of Tarantino. <laughs> and, and then he added that the company has already started an immediate and urgent dialogue with the studio. And then referring to Warner and AT&T. So but what I'm curious about, guys, this, uh, this uh, urgent dialogue that AMC has entered in with uh, with Warner. Yeah, uh, what I do you think is going to come out of that dialogue? Like, for instance, uh, Gary <laughs> Mimic. How do you think that dialogue is going to be? Oh, this is it. Please don't do this. Please don't do this. That's the dialogue. There you go. <laughs> I think oh, AT and T no. is going to say, "New phone. Who's this?" Uh, no, AT and T is Joaquin Phoenix in Gladiator right now. <laughs> At which point? <laughs> <laughs> Thumbs down. <laughs> I, I just think, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, MC can um, can say what they're planning to do, and I think, I think, you know, uh, you know, studios are going to sit there and say, yeah, let them rattle their sabers as much as they like. It's really, it's a, a done deal, and that as more time goes by, the, your power is going to ebb away. You know, I mean, we, again, again, I think really, you know, all Warner Brothers and, and everyone else to do is just don't answer the phone for six months. And yeah. let's, let's see how, <laughs> how, what cinema attendance is like and be let's, you know, the big thing to going to watch is let's see how 8.7 billion subs changes in the next uh, three months. Yeah, indeed. Pretty much. So, basically, so they're basically, they're going to be like, we're going to just put them to our voicemail and then just delete it after yeah, every yeah. weekend. <laughs> No, no, it's the it's the girlfriend who keeps wanting to go. Please give me another chance. Please give me another chance. You know, sorry, I'm I'm, I'm done. You know, I might give you a booty call one night, but that's, 
Well, and one thing I got from this, Andre, before you go on to your next portion is it almost sounded like, to answer one of our questions from last week, like they almost came to some kind of conclusion with Wonder Woman. Like they were actually going to show it, it almost sounded like. But now it's like, they're like, we had no clue they were going to put their entire slate out there. I, I, you know, yeah, maybe you're right. Again, Tom, like I said last time, when we discussed this and, um, oh, thank you, David S. That's very kind of you. Um, cheers, my friend. Um, I think, like I said, when we talked about this before, it was like there's there's a tipping point, isn't there? Everything with these subscription services, it's tipping point. It's like, you know, do I want Disney Plus at the moment? No, I don't want to watch Frozen 2 and all that. Oh, Mandalorian's on. Oh, now I'm interested. No, am I interested enough to do it? No. Uh, you know, oh, they're going to release Black Widow in in March. I'm still a little bit interested. Okay, you're going to get the whole slate. Now I'll buy it. Fuck it. I'm in. Same with HBO Max. Was I interested? I didn't even you know, consider HBO Max. It wasn't something I would have even thought about. And then they they kind of like their first little offering was Wonder Woman. No, I don't care. I actually don't think Wonder Woman's going to be as great as everyone might imagine it's going to be. I'm sorry, but I think I saw, Dune was the when key I saw to the this. Trailer and when I saw the trailer of Wonder Woman and saw that dodgy cheetah woman bouncing around i was like seriously this yeah is no really no no i think you're 100 percent right i think dune was a dune and godzilla were the two big keys to this that's what i said to andre matrix. what a week and a half ago. well matrix has barely been filmed yet but it's becoming one of those things where it's like wow it's just too much for me to not do it you know it's like oh this and this and this and this and this it's like okay fuck it it's like that's the cost of two visits to the cinema with you know, with a couple of kids you know it's like okay i'm, I'm in uh, and I think that's the tipping point. And I think, like I say, I I think whatever that Disney emergency meeting was, you've got to imagine that someone's at Disney, if they're not going to roll it out before the 11th, if they do, it's going to be, you know, this is the January release, February, March, April, May, June, finishing off with Little Mermaid at the end of the year. They have to do it, right? I mean, do we not think that Disney Plus are going to roll out their 2021 roster? Oh, absolutely. You're referring yeah. to on Wednesday. Oh, absolutely. We're going to... I think so. I bet that we are going to be hearing on Wednesday the uh, the release date for, for Black Widow on Disney 18+. plus. But, um, but yeah, we shall see. And That's that my prediction, a, at least. If they, roll out, if they roll out a 12-month roster, Kingsman, Ray and the Last Dragon, Black Widow, Cruella, Shang-Chi, Little Mermaid, if they roll that out, that is the stab in the heart. I mean... You know, and Deadpool do, three is going to be a big part of that. You know what I mean? It's like you're done. done. Deadpool three is going to be a big part of that too. And and again, I, I got to bring I'm up Daredevil. I, I'm and Daredevil if they bring Daredevil that into it. Yep. Yeah. And Blade if that. Well, that's like uh, it's phase five. That's old news. But no, like I, I wanted to bring Dune into this because that was the one that really kind of perked my ears up to begin with. Because I've been yeah. saying, you yeah. know, this is one that I think that is getting a little bit more attention than I think anybody anticipated. And putting that on HBO Max is a smart move because you're going to get a lot more people who will take a chance on it now who may not have gone to see it in theaters. What do you think, Andre? And that because I know you're a Dune fan, and I know that was something we had talked about. And like I said, we knew that was kind of going to happen. I think that uh, I I don't know that Dune would have been the massive blockbuster that they were hoping for in theaters. Maybe it would, but I honestly don't think so. And I see that uh, Gary is very much so in agreement. But I do think that on streaming, it's gonna be it's gonna be a theater killer. Everyone and their mom is going to want to see that on streaming. People that were like, no, nah, I don't kind of bother exactly seeing that in theater. Thinking, yeah. But if it's on HBO Max, I mean, just look at what the Dune 2000 adaptation or the year 2000 adaptation did for sci fi. It lifted them to a whole new level. Mm -hmm. but, but here's the thing I would say, probably, and Dune's probably the, the exception where I would say it is I would imagine. If I was to subscribe to HBO Max, I could 100% see me, you know, the day Dune is released, my wife's at work, I watch Dune during the day, and then I go, hey, honey, we're going to the cinema tonight to go and see Dune. And she's like, really? And I go, yeah, 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 yeah. We're going to go and see the cinema as well. Didn't you watch it today? Yeah, but we're going to go and see the cinema tonight. It's it's beautiful, and we have to go and see it on the screen. So, uh, you know, get dressed. We're going to go to the fancy dancy cinema, and uh, you'll have dinner and drinks and probably pass out halfway through. Uh, but I want to see it on the big screen, you know, because that is the kind of movie that you will want to go and have an event and see it. You know what I mean? Uh, I agree. I agree. And even I'm going to do that because there are a couple of 
couple of movies that I didn't see in theaters, and I regret it so immensely that I didn't see them in theaters. And uh, Dune, I have a strong feeling, is going to be one of them. So, of course, I'm going to see it the second it streams. And then I'm going to run out and see it in the theater. Biggest screen I can find. And I can tell you why I wasn't surprised when Godzilla came up, Andre, because we had this conversation almost, a, well, oh my God, almost six, seven months ago now, where I yeah, said that ages ago. I, God, even, I though Godzilla, even though Godzilla didn't do that great in theaters, I knew it was doing well on video. Remember me pointing that out, Andre? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I, this makes complete sense for them to be like, okay, we could be taking a big chance if we brought this out in theaters because, yeah, the last last Godzilla movie didn't do that great. Kong did a, okay, but if we pulled this on HBO Max, everybody's going to want to see this because it's yeah, King Kong think, versus Godzilla. Uh, well, it's Kong versus Godzilla versus Mecha Godzilla. Let's not forget. You know what I mean? I mean uh, Spoilers. No, I'm kidding. I, I knew, <laughs> but not everybody knew. <laughs> Uh, really? Really? You haven't figured that out, really? I knew, like I just said, I knew, but not <laughs> everybody knew. No, you, he's like, well, you can't have the two heroes fight against each other. They can at first, but then they, they, need a they got to gang up against I know. <laughs> Sorry, script spoiler, spoiler alert. <laughs> That's why Freddy versus Jason needed Pinhead. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, or yeah. Ash. <laughs> or yes. Ash, actually, oh, yes, Ash yeah. would have been better. But anyhow, yeah, yeah that, no, I, that script was written with Ash, so it yeah. was, yeah. But it no, was, I feel yeah. like that was, I, I feel like I knew Godzilla was kind of on the cards just simply because I feel like financially that what is going to make more sense for them. Yeah, the same absolutely. thing with Wonder Woman and kind of what I was getting at with Dune, which even though I noticed there was a bit more of a pent up uh, desire for Dune, because I, I don't know if you were on the show, Gary, when I pointed out that the Batman trailer was the, the dune trailer was outpacing the batman trailer and it had it was a month behind it so i was like that's weird you know because the batman is the batman i mean that's warner brothers biggest property i argument. don't i don't know that the batman that incarnation right there is going to be so no huge. i yeah i know i know and, and i'm biased against it so i i'm not seeing it clearly but uh, all I will say about that movie, and I believe I speak for many others, mm. no matter what I see, I remain unconvinced. Right. No, you could be right. I mean, I'm not. I'm just. Yeah, I'm just playing devil's advocate a little bit. But no, you're. Yeah. Uh, we've got him, Batman. I mean, I think. Yeah, I think they're taking it in too dark a territory. I think. Uh, you know. I think. Uh, you know. There's a lot of people. <clears throat> it's like you know, kids love Batman. You know, so kids still need to be able to go and see their superhero batman you know and i think it's gone down too dark a pathway i think it needs to be brightened up a little bit more fun for the for the kids you know it's still like it's like it's it's been taken over by you know emo goths you know for uh, you know batman it's like i understand yeah. the brooding hero and i get it and i like that but at the same time it's like he's a superhero kids should be able to go and enjoy it i mean i want to be a 13 14 year old and enjoying batman not like i mean i hope it's going to be you know have some he's going to be a good superhero not like a miserable bastard <laughs> i want yeah, you like to the do concept a of sorry go ahead tom I was just going to say, I want you to do a test, though, Andre. Go right now on Twitter and say Pattinson is going to suck his Batman and watch what happens. <laughs> well, one I'll thing that's... That? Yeah. What was I, can do, I can do that. <laughs> You're going to get... <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Trip. What are you going to say? Well, one thing with the concept of Batman is that he uses the darkness to pull people into the light. Like, he's a heroic thing. You don't want to keep him in... You know that brooding dark state it, it, he's a very hopeful character he just happens to function in a world that is very gruesome so you have to reconcile with that that yeah you set the stage that this is a terrible place gotham city but because of batman it's going to get better and, and that's the hopeful attitude that you want to have with a batman film and we haven't really seen that too often at least with the snyder cut of thing uh, snyder uh, take of it a little bit with um, nolan's dark knight films to a, to a degree and yeah, I think that's kind of what's been missing, especially on the comic book side of things. Like they just keep it grounded and almost in a state of arrested development where Gotham is never seeing any sort of like hope because Batman may have stopped the villain this week, but then there's a serial killer just wreaking havoc over everybody else and, and nobody feels any better as a result of it. So, and why should they at that point? But yeah, for the cinema going experience where you're dealing with a hero film, you want your audience to leave that film really excited and happy and, and, and uplifted uh, because that's the emotional journey. I mean, even myself and when I talk to other producers are like, nobody should really be paying $20 a movie ticket to go in and feel depressed for two hours. That's like, exactly how I <laughs> felt after Man of Steel. It, same here. Yeah. I came out of Man of Steel and said, I thought superheroes were supposed to be super, you know, not. 
Yeah. Now yeah. I'm going to get lambasted for saying that. <laughs> so, but, yeah. but there's ways where you can have your cake and eat it too with regards yeah. to the dark and broodingness thing. You just okay. have to be able to take yourself uh, like a step back with regards to that, to that um, like narrative and be like, okay, so how do I make this authentic and also hit that nail on the head with the reward of, yep, I want people to watch this movie again and again and again because the ending is just that great and it makes people really happy and, and wonderful to, to have seen their hero you know, come into their own and do the right thing and, and, and all that great stuff no absolutely i think uh, i mean i think a good example would be like you know something like joker you know went yeah. to the cinema loved it my wife loved it went to watch it on uh on netflix the, or on, on something the other night and my wife was like oh i don't want to go to that place she said i just i just want to watch a movie and, f and feel good you know like and i was like oh okay and she's like yeah it's just it's just it's a it's a grim world to enter you know and uh there are times when cinema should be like that absolutely but i think when you're dealing with films that you want to make uh, you know, have good repeat viewings, make a lot of money and uh, do really, really well. I think, uh, you know, um, sometimes, you know, you, you can have the odd one out there like Joker, you know, but I think generally they, they should have some, uh, like say, an uplifting curve, you know. Yeah, like Joker's got yeah. a bittersweet catharsis to it. Yeah. <laughs> but one thing Joker does have that a lot of other movies don't right now is a small budget. And yeah. I'm wondering if that has something to do with Andre's second question. Yeah. Um... What a segue, Tom. Indeed, that oh, very good segue. Because here's the thing, uh, that we are now getting reports that Warner are getting some major pushback from their production partners on all of these movies that they unilaterally decided these are going to go straight to HBO Max. But for instance, let's just stick with Dune. Because, uh, yeah, Warner, they put up a part of the budget, but Legendary, they yeah. put up much more of the budget. On Legendary, they're going to get a bigger stake. Um, yeah, and that's yeah. what my guy was yeah. telling me, is they had to make a deal with Legendary for Godzilla and stuff. Yeah, but 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 this you have the exact same situation with uh, close to every other movie right there. Uh, not all of them are fully funded by Warner. If it's fully funded by them, if they're the only party involved, then they can do that. But the moment that you have another party involved, and that party expects a box office split, and Warner unilaterally decides that there's not going to be any box office, or for all intents and purposes, yeah, you can say that you put it in theaters, but in reality, you will undercut the theaters by putting it day and date in uh, in HBO uh, Max and Warner and AT and T. They, of course, they will benefit from the increased subscription from HBO Max. But what about their production partner? Uh, they're just going to get screwed over, aren't they? What do you guys think is going to happen with this? Tripped. <laughs> That's where I was confused that they've. I thought they would have made a deal. I was. Yeah. I was. I thought that's what happened. I thought that's why we got that trailer because that's what my guy was telling me. Because like that, your point exactly, Andre. And I want to hear what Script and Gary have to say about this too. Because that's what I was told was like you have all these other production companies that have to sign off on this shit before they can just do this. Uh, my take is, I mean, uh, you know, Script would be the same thing. I would imagine. You know, before a movie is sold, you know, we have to, everything has to be tied up and buttoned off and every ribbon and every T crossed and every L, I dotted and everything else before a movie is packaged and sold. I, I can't imagine a company as as big as Warner Media uh, would just go, hey, let's just put out a trailer saying that we're releasing our movies without their legal department going, uh, well, we have to do this first right, guys, and kind of figuring it out. I just have to believe that's what a legal department is in place for. Uh, like I say, I mean, I've worked on films where you show a candy bar and it has to be approved before you can do it or a song or anything. So um, I, I have to believe that there are a bunch of uh, pe pen pencil pushers who uh, sat in a room with a big document saying we have to, you know, this has to be organized with the whatever production entities involved with them and make right with them. So uh, I, if it, I, I have to believe that's the case. So is it 100% true what's been reported that there's all this flack or is, is it actually been sorted out? I would have to believe that no one in a, a, a corporate entity of that size would be so naive as to release a trailer and say they're going to do this without having uh, sorted out the necessary paperwork before. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of on that side because, again, when these movies were initially started, they were all built under a, sing a production model that involved theatrical release. Like, that was their understanding of it. There could have been negotiated, especially since HBO Max uh, was being a thing 
and AT&T was uh, in charge at that time, there could have been uh, addendums in that contract with regards to streaming services that could have been put in place in case of, you know, down the road type of thing that they could probably reinstitute earlier as a result, which means it foregoes whatever percentages would be at the theater. And it just kind of kicks into that next tier, which is this is the new contract for the streaming service type of things. But I'm pretty sure that would have to have been negotiated or renegotiated within, uh, you know, when they made that decision that, yeah, we're going to put our 2021 slate on because you, it would just be weird if Legendary and any other production houses that were co-financed in would just be blindsided by this. It would just yeah, be really weird. Wouldn't this pertain to uh, basically, you know, the USA, ter you know, Northwest Territory, you know, like, you know, most production companies uh, of any ilk tend to retain the USA and then overseas belongs to those companies involved. So the yeah. OPs are still going to be released as a, a theatrical experience because HBO Max doesn't exist in those uh, territories. So really all it is, it's uh, it's Warner Brothers saying we've just decided we're not going to release you know, in America, uh, you know, Northwest Territories, you know, Canada, et cetera, uh, like we normally do. But we own those. right? They're our rights. That's our distribution portion. So it doesn't affect you guys because you're the overseas rights. Exactly, because they're looking at it from the infrastructure point of view. Like because there is an HBO match and streaming services throughout Europe, China, and all that stuff on the same level as what we have in North America, it should be kind of like a non-issue. But I can also understand that other production companies saying like, well, we're still losing some some money as a result of that. But I figured that would have to have been handled out prior to it anyways, just in that case. Like I said, I can't imagine anyone, like I say, we, you know, how many times have we been finished over, over tiny details before a movie's finished? So I can't believe that. Like I yeah, said, I've signed movie contracts. Movie. That's an idea. Let's release all our movies. Okie dokie. Throw that like trailer I've, out there, Frank. Exactly. Like I've signed contracts where it's like we, we retain the rights to all current existing media forms and anything that has yet to be done in the universe throughout That's the rest of time. <laughs> it's like, yeah. okay, I guess. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I, so there you go, Andre. I think I might know what's going on here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do share. Um, cause going through what I remember my guy saying and what's going on here, like, you know, I keep pushing this whole, they're doing it because of HBO max, not because of the pandemic thing. And you know, everybody's just kind of like, yeah, yeah, we get that. I think my guy was stressing it so much cause it's a little bit more nefarious than it's, it's kind of on its surface. And I think that's what these people are like between legendary AMC and everybody else are accusing Warner brothers right now. I think there was kind of an initial, like, fuzzy deal in place that yeah you're gonna do wonder woman you're gonna do godzilla and you're gonna do dune because remember those were the three movies we had talked about andre but then all of a sudden they're like oh no we're gonna do the entire slate i think they just took an assumption that they kind of had like a loose kind of deal knowing that things were you know in a shitty state right now and they were gonna do those few movies just and then kind of do a wait and see kind of thing and i think everybody's like warner brothers jumped the gun and they're basically accusing them of what i've been saying is that you're doing this only for HBO Max and not because theaters are going to be hobbled for the next six months to a year. I think that's really what it boils down to. So, like, I think, and that's what I, I'm getting from this article, is, like, Legendary's like, wait a minute, they probably, because they're probably only going to see a small portion of what they normally would have seen. And it sounds like there was a deal with Netflix to Netflix involved with godzilla and kong or something like that too going back to something you've said before andre about all the pre previous license that are already in place for a lot of these movies since they hadn't initially planned on having hbo max ready for another year or two indeed indeed so yeah it's going to be interesting to see how that is going to because um, i guess there was out. a 250 million dollar deal with netflix evidently so i'm assuming like once yeah. it went to video that netflix would have gotten so now that's probably netflix is rapping at their door going wait a minute no, no, no. That, I believe, will have been sorted. I think that is a Maybe. big part of the reason for why they're only showing these movies for for 31 days, and then they disappear again. Because here's the thing. Yeah, they're releasing their entire slate, but they're not releasing the entire slate to stay. They're releasing each movie for 30 days or 31 days, and then it's gone. That's and what I'm saying is they're getting come back at some point. And I do believe that part of that is that they want to create some level of urgency. But I think a bigger part of it is because that is how long they have leased the movie back, uh, back from whatever international partner that they have licensed the movie out to to begin with. And they have to license them back again that was the case when they launched uh, hbo max and they had all of these dc movies there well 
every single one of those movies, they were licensed to other streamers. So they had to license them, license them back again from those for a for a fee for a limited time only. That's kind of what I'm getting at here is like, I don't know about how, what deals were in place because I'm thinking is Netflix and some of these other places are getting upset because HBO is using loopholes and, and the pandemic as a, as an excuse to further HBO max. That's what my guy was saying. And that's what they're basically, it's almost like creating an unfair, uh, uh, disadvantage for HBO max is what I'm trying to get to. Cause like you said, yeah, it, it'll only have be there for a month. But now Netflix and all these other places that have paid for prepaid for it for the the later streaming are seeing that as probably unfair competition is what I'm getting at. Yeah, indeed. Hey guys, if the quarterback the quarterback gets injured, you uh, you know you go hard on D. You know what I mean? Like it's <laughs> you know that's what you do. You know. No, you right? Know? Like I I can't blame Warner for what they're doing, but I can completely see where the other sides are getting upset but i think what's going to happen is the end is legendary might walk away with a little bit of money but i don't think they're going to have any legal loopholes to get through right now until theaters and everything are open but i, I get where they're coming from like the the whole jumping the gun because that was where i got taken by surprise because i knew like some of their bigger movies were going to get announced for hbo max but i didn't expect everything no it's a monster monster announcement a monster mm -hmm. absolutely it's a game-changing announcement that's what it is that's absolutely what is what it is. And make uh, no bones. I mean, we talk about you know, oh, you know, the possibility of it just being a uh, for this year. No, this is a uh, this is a test run. Obviously, you know, this is a, you know. exactly. They're trying to build a brand new model, and they're trying to figure out all the kinks while they can. And this is a great uh, excuse for them to do it, especially if there's like insurances tied to that as well. Like they're able to say, well, we're not going to be spending a whole lot of money because we we planned a little bit of these eventualities, perhaps to a degree, and then. They're, they're like, okay, now that we've done this first model, how can we make the most money out of it? And they just start reworking it and chipping it away throughout that entire year as as it goes until it becomes the new standard. No, I mean, and uh, that's absolutely right. And I mean, and the one thing you should absolutely give them credit for is that they weren't uh, so ridiculously sanctimonious to stand there and say, we're doing it all for you to protect you and to help you and to look after you. And, you know, this is for the good of the people, you know I mean? At least they didn't do that. You know, they didn't try and sugarcoat it. I mean, so, um, yeah. Indeed. Could have been done. Could have been a uh, you know miracle on thirty seventh seventh street moment there. Yeah. <laughs> well, this goes back to what you know we were saying way back when this first started. Andre is the only people who could really save the theaters are the studios, if they yeah. really wanted to. But they don't want to. Uh, to go back to Gary's point, exactly. Yeah. Uh, on the contrary, I think they want to off them. I think they're they're very happy with uh, with simply altering their model and their way of conducting business to scale it for streaming. Uh, the only thing that they dislike, I think, is that this happened right now when they still have a year's worth of movies, some, some of them blockbusters, yeah. in the can. Let me and they also have like some things where the where the where the train is already rolling and cannot be stopped that stuff like that they don't like but the moment that they can't control what you're going to see is heavily scaled down content for streaming that's what i think yeah basically the scenario here is the movie industry or the studios are darth vader the movies are han solo and uh, the theaters are lando calrissian <laughs> It's pretty much it. Like, we don't need you. You're just here. You're just lucky to be alive. But guess what? This could change at any time. The deal's getting worse, and it's going to get worse. You know, it's just it's kind of what it is. No, the, yeah. way I, the way I would equate it is this. It's, uh, it's Godzilla and Kong having a battle, and the cinemas are the city in which they are battling. In. That could be another good scenario as well. well. You yeah. are yeah. going to get decimated as these two giants go to war. That as and well, the who, and the people who get to enjoy it are the people who get to stand back you know, on on another a, a mile a, a mile away watching and watch the big fight and spew. You know, we're the ones who get yeah, to they, from watching the fight, but the city will be destroyed with while the fight takes place. Did you read my Power Rangers script, Gary? Because <laughs> 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 I have that joke in there towards the end. <laughs> oh shit! Uh, we should have, we should get caught up on the rest of these super chats. What do you yes, say? Yes, we have uh, we have a few super chats, and then we have to uh, to see the results of my experiment from tweeting that uh, that Pattinson was going to suck. Because I actually did tweet that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but to get uh, get into the super chats uh, first, uh, 
uh, we have uh, we have uh, um, Matt G says you think streaming YouTube slash YouTube personalities or other non movie content to theaters would ever be a thing or renting out theaters to gamers. Well, we know that someone actually has rented a theater for that end already. So I think that as I believe it was Matt are... G. <laughs> was it? Oh, I yeah. Think so, yeah. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Well, there you go. Well, now that uh, the theaters have lots of screens available, so while they're still open, I'm sure they're going to appreciate any kind of renting deal that they can without asking too many questions. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Why not? I think, and, uh, I think the, the answer there is that again, the problem if you're a chain, you can't as a chain, as a as a, a, a regional chain individual manager, you can't make those kind of decisions. But if you're an independent little owned, set, you know, cinema, you need yeah. to be more proactive in how you're using your space for parties, for conventions, for God knows what. You know, have a have a weekend horror convention or a weekend sci-fi convention of movies. They're going to have to be very, you know, really kind of attack and and pro. Uh, kind of like uh, strategy for making their cinema pay for them. But the problem with a big AMC is that some local regional manager who runs the local AMC won't be able to do that without getting head office involved and blah, blah, blah. They're, they're too tied in their own red tape to be able to you know, profit. So it'll be like, you know, man mantras coming down from head office. Oh, we're going to implement this and do this, but it won't work. Uh, it, it's going to be, it'll be too stuffy and too tied up in its own red tape, but small, independently owned yep. theater will totally do that and do parties and like i say and all kinds of stuff and it comes down upon them to do a gaming opportunity and uh, yeah that's the way to go forward and that's the way to maximize your uh, you know your space to the full 24 hours seven days a week absolutely i think you're dead on with that and that's where i think that this is going to end up is the chains are going to die the yeah. independents are going to grow because they're going to be innovative. They're going to have other avenues and ways they can do things. They're not going to have to go through, like Gary just said, a bunch of red tape to do something. So there you go. Yeah, indeed. All right, let's get back to the super chats. Uh, we had Miladen077, who says for $10, thank you so much. As a kid, going to the theaters with friends was, a gr was great, but now as an adult with a career... I'd rather invest in a large OLED TV and enjoy movies with friends at home without interruptions. And R mm, says for $5, Hi, gents. Streaming is okay, but I miss these special features that you get from physical media. I love director's cuts. Well, yeah, you're not even getting any special features on physical media these days yeah. anymore. And like I said, we're definitely, we've been planning, and I know we keep talking about it, but... There has been a little bit more movement on it. I've been talking to Robert Meyer Burnett a little bit more, and we're going to definitely do that video about independent, uh, not independent, uh, physical media. Jesus. Yeah. And Pilgrim Media says, if theaters die, we sail the high seas. Wink, wink. And Blue Satoshi says, intermission. That was your spot for a uh, plug there, Andre, I think. Yeah, I know it was a plug, but we'll do plug later. We have, uh, we have many more super chats to go through. <laughs> 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 but, but since you already said it uh yeah you do not do not sail the high seas but if you do say the high seas then you need to protect yourself and your data and you then you might as well do it with surfshark vpn right when i just also wanted to point out that like that was an avenue we didn't even get into but people were bringing up in the chats is like yeah this whole thing's going to open up a whole new problem for piracy, but like, yeah, that's almost a whole nother conversation. Okay, let, okay let's just say that you're going to see loads of surf shark spots to come. And and yeah, Blue Satoshi said intermissions scared me as a kid. Felt very uncanny, like like things were about to go off the rails. Just felt wrong somehow like some lurking horror and willie woodward says sorry gary don't see people streaming and cinema well I mean, maybe not the most but some people i'm sure they oh, kind yeah, of I, are okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like like well, look at all the big movies this year they've been empire strikes back goonies uh, <laughs> Uh, what was some of the other ones that pe they just re-released here? A few uh, Beetlejuice was a big one this October. Yeah, I remember people, yeah. people, movies that people Hocus already Pocus. have it, both on DVD, Blu-ray, and on stream. Oh yeah, Hocus so Pocus. Yeah, in Nothing fact, huge numbers, but they, they still were talking of a sequel this year already. <laughs> yeah, because of okay, yeah, between the re-release and it doing so well on Disney Plus and it being 
because here's the thing, folks, that we'll get into in the Blu-ray thing. As far as we've been hearing, Hocus Pocus and Home Alone are going to be the last two classic uh, live-action films that Disney plans on releasing on Blu-ray and 4K Blu-ray. And I think because it sold so well, that's why that sequel's getting made. Well, also that, I heard Bette Miller made a joke that she doesn't have to wear as much makeup for the sequel. Because well, they've been talking about making a sequel for over a decade, but it's just never happened because the first movie didn't make that much money in theaters. It did not, no. And a lot but of people I, confused it with the computer game at the time, which is nothing like it at all. <laughs> but I think between over the years, the video sales, and then just this last boost of you know popularity between the re-releases. Yeah. What were you saying, Gary? I'm sorry. A beloved movie now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, and then um, let's uh, let's uh, move uh, move on. Um, uh, Tonister Tree says, "I'd stream and in theater worthy movies like Dune." Yeah, there you go. And GMTC Podcast says, "Still holding out for Batfleck versus Deathstroke movie that is coming." If if the Snyder Cut is a hit for HBO Max and it gets low subscribers and HBO Max does well, you will be getting Batflick versus Deathstroke, either as a movie or as a series, guaranteed. And I don't, I don't see how that can't be a hit. I mean, really? I mean, yeah. what, what the bottom line number on that thing is that they, they've had to spend to make it to, for a, a four hour, you know, huge super movie, a superhero movie. That must have cost, a, you know, a nickel on a dime, you know, to actually turn over in terms of cost, you know, and the amount of a, a traction it's already getting. I mean, it's a, actually about it's 80 million. It's the number they're saying out loud. If that's true, I don't know, but they're claiming 80 million. Uh, eight, the cost eight, of another eight, movie. Yeah, <laughs> eighty million dollars. Eight, eight, one eight, 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 eight zero. Eight, zero. <laughs> I think the reason for that is cheese on it, Walker. I tell you, I think it's not as done as people think it is, and I also think that they're going to have to repay everybody to yeah. come back. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and they're also they're bringing in, for instance, sure. Jared Leto. He's filming new scenes that were never in there before. Because here's the thing. The Snyder Cut that was done, that was a two-hour cut. Oh, the yeah. Snyder Cut that they're releasing, that is the the work print like or, or the assembly cut. All the footage with even more added, chopped into four episodes. And that's never been finished. That's so never been color cut. Then. You have to imagine then that quite simply, <clears throat> based off the, gen the in image interest generated in the original two-hour cut, that obviously it was enough to warrant that Warner Brothers said, hey, let's spend some more money and we can actually make a huge amount of money and create so much excitement. Because I saw the lineup where you saw all of the characters potentially together, you know, for the first time. And uh, clearly that had superhero fans frothing at the hilt. So, I mean, uh, it makes sense, doesn't it? You know, I mean, um, it could be a, a you know, a, a mammoth success for them because uh, it's kind of money in the, in the bank, you know? Yeah. But that's a year off. And that's what my guy was telling me. He's like, they have no game of Thrones, Batman or uh, the Snyder cuts a year off the Batman series. Plural are at least a couple of years off. Um, it's, yeah, it's going to be a, a big empty space. That's why they did this. Yeah. Well, not exactly. anymore. But basically, the Snyder Cut was their Mandalorian, and their Mandalorian is, uh, is uh, almost a year off. So they need something else. And yeah, that's what we're seeing this. And moving back to the to the Super Chats, uh, mm, says the director's cut with commentary was great. Hearing what the director had intended while watching the film gave another perspective. Mead does it too. Yeah. I uh, wonder if he means uh, special features in general or on Hellraiser Judgment in particular. Uh, for those that haven't wondered, the official commentary track for Hellraiser Judgment is actually on Midnight's Edge. It so is. So check that out. Yeah. I'm very yeah. happy with that. Yeah. One of these and days, maybe we'll do some Uber documentary for it or something. I, I don't know how you can be any more ubered than what we already have here. Because I want to kill myself in some way trying to edit this thing. To <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Don't worry. You know Health Racer too well. I'll find something else for you. Oh, so I know. There's plenty of things for me to do. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, for those that don't want, for those that did, didn't get, quite get that, Tom is the one that has been editing the video for the 
two-hour-long interview with Friedrich Malmberg that we put out yesterday. If you haven't seen it, you go watch that, because those are two very, very interesting hours, whether you like Conan or not. And just the industry insight there is freaking fantastic. So that uh, should be of universal interest if you like Midnight's Edge. But with that plug out of the way, uh, Mr. Tickle Trunk uh, also says, worried special features are dead. Warranted fear? Yeah, we're going to get back to that in that separate show that uh, Tom is teasing. Yeah. And Captain Spire says, maybe forcing back to TV will generate better TV. That's what I think. I well, think we kind of seen that. It's been pretty good as it is. It's TV's pretty amazing. Yeah. Well, streaming has yeah. kind of upped the ante on TV. Well, it kind of started with uh, pay TV with like HBO and Showtime and stuff doing, you know, uh, premium series. Yeah, Band of Brothers and Brothers yeah, and, and like Deadwood that. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, this has been the way for years after Sopranos and everything else. I mean, it's been on a, a yeah. full ever since. You know? Yeah, long form is where it's at. That's where you have the quality drama. Now. That, that's why you get like the David Finchers and stuff making that's making the original content for the streamers and not making movies. So Cobra Kai. That. Cobra Kai. I mean, for instance, yeah, that would have never. Like, 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 let, let's look at this real quick in a quick perspective without going too far. If they'd have tried to make Cobra Kai as a movie, it probably would have flopped. Nobody would have yeah. went to see it. it, it but now, with the the way they did it, the way they handled it, it was lightning in a bottle. Like that's the prime example. You like, you're never going to get that very often, but you're going to get that one in a million chance at a franchise that had so much potential to keep growing and growing and growing. And this is it. But if you do it wrong, you're going to screw it up. I mean, there's, there's been great, how many more examples of that, Andre, just about everything we've covered. Well, yeah, it's kind of much. funny because soap operas had that serialized format for decades and now it's being tra transferred over into the more serious type of drama action and comedy th uh, shows, at least in the late nineties and early two thousands. And they're seeing that the model works. And I remember when I was starting out, I was pitching like, hey, I think I want to do this type of series because at the time it was really like Heroes and Sopranos were like only the big ones at the moment were really going. And everybody was saying, well, we're still kind of on the episodic type of thing right now. Can you do something episodic? And I was like, oh, I'll rework it. <laughs> and then, you know, you go back to the drawing board because you, you don't say no. But yeah, like in some cases, there's a lot of people within the industry that are very much ingrained into what they know works and want to stay there. And there's not so many people that want to do trailblazing, but we're slowly seeing, especially with, with streaming, getting into more popularity. Yeah, it's we've got 15 years of success, proven successes of serial format shows, and that's going to be the new norm now. Episodic is going to be, you know, uh, kind of like very rare, if, if not gone by the, by, I'd say by 2024. Yeah, you've got to imagine that people are looking back at properties and thinking, how could we do something akin to this? You know, like mm -hmm. if it was me, I'd be going, somebody call Carrie Elwes and let's look at Princess Bride and see there, if we yeah. a little spin off series of the fairy tale worlds, you know what I mean? Or, you know, and uh, get Wally Shawn back and, uh, you know, Mandy Panty. Oh, I, I believe there's someone's working on a Peter Pan television series right now that they're trying to shop. I'm sure they've got they've got that reboot of uh, Princess Bride already in the works, and I said how they could do it better. But remember that script? I think you were yeah, on that show. They, yeah. they shouldn't do a reboot of Princess yeah. Bride at all. <laughs> William Goldman's spinning in his grave right now. <laughs> well, like I said, it wouldn't be fun to visit with uh, you know the Dread Pirate Roberts now after 25. Oh yeah. Years. Well, that's yeah. what I yeah that was my concept is like you have Fred Savage telling the story to his kid, and what it's well, about I, is is Carrie Elwes and uh, what's her face's daughter. Buttercup. Buttercup's daughter uh, in the story is now the Dread Pirate people Roberts. People need as much makeup. There you go. So, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Well, and let's press, press to... that, giant, that giant Indian guy, that wrestler, to be Andre's brother. You know, and he's come back. He's come back to help. You know, what's his name? Raj or Rupta or his name is. You know, a giant Indian guy who was in uh, the Longest Yard. Oh yeah. Oh, what's his name? He'd be his cousin. Uh, you'll yeah. know my cousin. You know. <laughs> You can have great fun with something like that. You know, it'd be easy to do. Four part series, you know. Right, and stuff like Cobra yeah. Kai is cheap. I mean, yeah. yeah, they have to pay a little bit for you know the talent, but again, like that's where we've talked about before is the talent's going to have to learn to try and you know take a chance, and then if there's a hit, yeah, then they the start to ask for, for those guys. I mean, you've got to imagine that the people who are in Cobra Kai are like, oh wow, I never imagined the door would knock again. You know what I mean? Like those guys must be so happy to be in a trailer. You know, to a point, don't... yeah. But they actually had a hard time getting Ralph Macchio on board. Yeah, like he okay. was very resistant. 
but I'm sure the others are just absolutely thrilled. It's, uh, it's oh yeah, yeah. Well, they took it seriously. Well, that was the whole thing. Is Isn't the rumors of the shoe coming back? Isn't that right? Yep. Well, yeah, it's kind of that's set the rumor. Up. <laughs> <laughs> they they did set it up. Yeah. I would yeah. not be surprised. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She left the boys around the time that they would have uh, recruited her for shooting. So, yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's get back to some uh, some more super chats. Um, uh, D- Donald Dolan for ten dollars. Thank you so much. Says great live stream, gentlemen. Very Thank informative. You. Have you heard the rumor regarding Jeff Bezos possibly purchasing either AMC or Regal Theater chains? No. I've heard the rumor, surprised. but I do. I've heard a rumor, but I do not know the accuracy of it. Have you heard a rumor of Jeff Bezos possibly purchasing Earth? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah, I think I he knew... wants to buy Cambodia. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, don't know. Uh, I can absolutely see that uh, that uh, Amazon would uh, would want uh, would want to do that. Uh, if not not to retain the theaters. But to use most, of, but to use most of it for the land, and to keep some of it as Amazon theaters uh, wouldn't surprise me. So exactly. I do, I do not know that uh, that there is any truth to it. But if there is, I would not be surprised. I would think in a world we're moving forwards. To me, that would feel like something of a step backwards for Bezos. You know, like it's 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 uh, in a world where. Uh, um, less tangible assets are kind of like the thing. I think it, it'd be like, why? Why am I doing this? You know, we're, we're heading to a world of digital media and digital technology. Why do I need to actually have a physical presence? It requires too much, too much, um, you know, overhead and stuff. Just general maintenance and land care and cleaning and washing and, and people. It's just like, it's, it's, it's unnecessary. But let me, let me I give can, you I one scenario. Take reason. I, I sorry, go on to Tommy. Probably well, you might have the same reason I was going to yeah. say is, okay, you got Amazon theaters. Let's say you have an Amazon Prime account. You go to those theaters, they got all their big, like coming to America too is coming to Amazon, Borat too. But yet you can go see them in Amazon theaters and they make that extra money at the theater because you get, you buy your popcorn, you buy your soda, you get a discounted price to go in, but you're still giving them extra money, even though you already paid for that movie with your Amazon Prime account. Then that would only work if it was Amazon popcorn, Amazon Pepsi. Amazon. Well, that's the thing is they yes. do. That's, that's exactly it. They they would own the entire uh, distribution chain, including the concessions, because well, that's then you could have the Amazon whole thing, and you know what they would do then. Then they would compete out uh, all of the uh, all of the Alamos as well. They would own the entire thing. Would it be a hugely profitable? No, but it would give them power. Yeah, I think that's the thing. It's more of a prestige yeah. thing. So that's why I see him doing that. The day that Bezos purchased Amazon uh, Cinemas AMC, he purchased Coca Cola the same day. That would be the interesting thing to see. Yeah, you you don't you joke about it, but yeah, don't even joke about it. Yeah, I'm not. I would not be fucking surprised if that's the headline tomorrow morning. (laughs) But that's the reality of it. See, is like. Well, it it is the reality. Money. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, unless we can sell the popcorn and the candy. Then, yeah. then we buy the fucking popcorn and candy company, guys. Exactly. Go. Basically, yeah. Amazon buys Orbo Redenbacher and then Coca-Cola. And he's like, you know, Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Bezos Absolutely. uses Coke over Pepsi is Absolutely. the headline. <laughs> Don't be surprised. Absolutely. Yeah. And that way, that way, they would own the entire distribution chain and every aspect of it. They would have outcompeted everyone else and they will pocket any profit from that for themselves no one else gets it so i'm just saying guys yeah. if this happens right in the next three weeks then i'm i'm running away because this will be the second <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> bezos is people this, this how the fuck did you know about this <laughs> if yeah. that happens i'm sorry you know well i would su- suspect if he does buy amc he's using it for the land and every single theater is going to be just a fulfillment center for amazon yeah. you're not even that. thinking that big gary if i was you right now i'd be like mr bezos if you are listening i have a tv series about a guy <laughs> let me tell you about <laughs> <laughs> well the one i suggested next was honestly where malls become uh, a mall all you do is you don't you have a shop that literally all it is is um, one size of every cloth and you go in you try it on and as you walk out you made your orders made and two days later it arrives at your house so shops don't carry any stock anymore they're literally just a window with like one size of every <laughs> item so it's like that store in 40 year old virgin where she has an a, a, a ebay store but she has a store in the mall but you can't buy you can't anything buy at the it. store in the mall <laughs> you gotta go online <laughs> 
but you don't have enough, you don't have, to have any stock space or deliveries or anything like that you just have one one set of items you go and you try and as you go and you get i like this one it fits perfectly click bing and two days later it arrives at your house via amazon that will be an amazon mall i think in the next few years so i don't think you're far off one, yeah and then they'll just get the at home version eventually like you just buy a box that just takes your measurements well no actually do it <laughs> gary's right because look at what a mall like going to most cities before even the pandemic the malls were just dying yeah they were these giant space because they have to have so much you know storage space and carry stock and stuff on the things it's like no we only have this mount or you can go and try it on one size of each there's very little you don't need a lot of maintenance you don't need a lot of staff in there it's almost like you could go and do automated purchase and the person's just there to watch and absolutely watch the, the make sure nobody steals anything <laughs> you use the old jc penny or sears as your storage your amazon storage and then the rest of the place you're exactly right no i think you're 100 percent right dear mr bezos please find me <laughs> yeah right no that's what i'm saying you're looking at it this wrong way gary why run from him be like hey man i'm an idea guy yeah indeed indeed well let's uh let's get back to we have a couple more super chats and then we're caught up uh woolly woodward says dumb question how are studios going to make money over the years when their incentive structure is to get users which has a ceiling and to keep users price keeps going up why do you think uh, Netflix just announced their prices going up? Well, they also that. they need constant content. Yeah, well, that's the thing, and, and and this is all amortized through clicks. Like, if you watch a Warner Brothers movie on Netflix, they have to pay Warner Brothers a percentage of your subscription. But if you watch that new Adam Sandler movie that Netflix produced, Netflix gets to keep that percentage. That's how. That's how that all works. It's it's just a, a it game of clicks. It all comes a very simple thing, you know, in answer to the, the, whoever the person was. I can't think of his name. But, uh, you know, the Netflix pie is $20 billion. It's a $20 billion pie that people are trying to get a share of right now. Now, obviously, Netflix spends more than that every year. They have consecutively spent more than that every year. But what everyone wants a piece of is that $20 billion pie. Uh, so, you know, that's how they make the money. You know? It's like it's there. The money is there to be had. Yeah. And uh, continuing with uh, with the super chat uh, to um, uh, to get fully caught up, uh, Tiberius Monk eighty four says, "While I do miss the theater experience, I'm fine staying home. When my friend had a large sized drink thrown at him, that's my cure to exit for good." Now harkens back to what we said before. And Captain Spire says. Alamo theaters offered old movies for those who missed it the first time. Maybe they could offer TV viewing on the big screen to stay relevant. Now that's they already, already have. Yeah. yeah, that's already happened. Games and, and uh, boxing matches. And, and Willie yeah. follows up here, though, with, uh, yeah, but Netflix is generally running at a loss. Yes, they yeah. are. But you know what? We Doesn't just matter. found <laughs> we found out from uh, one of our uh, uh, active guests here on the morning show, Tom Conkle, that they don't pay you until you're done with your contract. That's how they keep doing this. They, they basically, they don't pay you till the last minute. And that's another thing I've heard too. It's a deferred payment contract for yeah. some of their properties. Yeah. Some of them they have to pay in advance. Many of them, they don't. <laughs> <clears throat> Most huge companies run to a loss anyway, but they generate such an enormous amount of money and income for everyone involved that it's a, it's a, it's a profitable, it's an entity worth keep going. You know what I mean? It's not yeah. like it, it's it's making that much money. It's, it's a monster organization. That, yeah. Yes, it loses, but it's a it's a it's a train that's on the move. So yeah, the train might be deteriorating, but there are so many people and so many working parts that you keep it going anyway because it's generating such a huge amount of cost amount of money. Yeah, technically it's a loss, but uh, it's in in accounting that's that's not an issue. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like it, it doesn't matter. It continually makes money. Yeah, the, yeah. the employees yeah. the employees cash a check, but the business does not, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. And it's not the old profit sharing thing, like you know the the writer of Batman who, who made no money. It's like the film's made no profit since nineteen since it was released. Yeah, it hasn't made any profits, but everyone's been paid regularly every year and bought new cars and we had new offices and everything else. But we didn't technically make a profit. I mean, I've had a company for many many years, and your accountant tells you every year, you know, you 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 want to end the year on zero, so spend spend and buy and and, yeah. uh, and update and everything else. So. Well, uh, let me I was going to say, let me basically explain this way to Willie. This is how they make their money. Um, not everybody buys a Blu-ray every month, right? Like we've all just said here, like Gary, you said you haven't bought a Blu-ray in how long probably? Oh, an actual wait, physical entity? Um, yeah, and you wait until 
Yeah, Captain Marvel was the last one I bought. Yeah, and you wait until they're generally cheap, right? So here's the thing. Most people don't buy physical media anymore, but what Warner Brothers looks at it is, is okay, the price of HBO Max is $15 a month, right? That's roughly about what they would make after all the, the overhead costs, da, da, da. So they bring in like 10 bucks per person, let's say, 10 bucks a head. That's probably roughly what they would make on a Blu-ray. But not everybody buys one. But everybody who has an account now is basically buying a Blu-ray every month that they never would have bought before. And if they put one of their movies every month on there, like Wonder Woman or Dune, it's like you going out and buying that Blu-ray every month. So you have all them people basically going out and buying that Blu-ray. But they didn't have to make that blu-ray they didn't have to ship that blu-ray they didn't have to give you know a portion of that it's all in their pocket now so it's straight revenue right in their pocket now maybe that's not covering every cost but if you look at it in that sense i don't know if that makes sense to andre especially from a financial point of view if you get what i'm getting at oh yeah no absolutely like uh, that's the same thing with uh, with netflix i think that they are going to be uh, more profitable in the years to come by necessity because if you look at one of their biggest expenses sure. that is uh, that is that they have to um, license so much content like it's licensed they, yeah. they have to pay a huge rental fee not to the to the little guys but to the huge things to to the marvels and stuff like that they have to pay so much and all that content is going to get taken away and in a few years when HBO Max uh, gets out of their contracts and all of their Warner content is going to go away, all their Disney content is already gone, uh, apart from like some some limited uh, Marvel stuff that's still there. Uh, and that way, they're gonna they're gonna save money on that. Of course, they're still gonna have to pay money for their own productions, but that doesn't have to cost so much. So I think that even they are going to be more profitable. But also. I think I Gary's can, meeting uh, went well. Share number of subscribers <laughs> uh, times uh, times uh, the the monthly fee. There's a lot of money to collect there, and that is why we are seeing a streaming wars right now. Because for the ones that win and become a must-have service, they're basically made as long as they structure their finances accordingly. But yeah, <clears> there you go. Is, I that mean, the cost? is that the cost, Tom? Fifteen dollars a month by HBO Max. Yep. Yep. And that's what I'm saying. Like that, that's it makes complete sense. Like if you look at it from that perspective, so not every you, yeah. What, what is the cost? What is the cost roughly? Do you think <clears throat> for two adults, two children, popcorn and concessions to go to the cinema? Oh, a lot more than that, and it makes sense. Like we. No, what, what is that number roughly? Do you think? <sighs> well, roughly, yeah, because depending on where you're what? going, yeah. So two, two trips to the cinema, you can buy you HBO Max for the year. Yep. Wow. There you go. 21 movies, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like it makes it, it makes sense for everybody all around. And and again, it's it's a it's gonna happen. It is what happening. It's happening. <laughs> what you, what else can you say? Anyway, fast talking pimp stick. <laughs> fast talking pimp stick. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you have to go and check out Gary's movies. So, yes, indeed. Uh, yeah. um, Andre, did we have any more Super Chats to catch up on? No, we are caught up on Super Chats. Mm -hmm. I just want to give you an update because I, uh, for the first time, I actually uh, hosted, posted a, a, a troll tweet, if you will, uh, brought on by our discussion earlier because I actually took the challenge. And I tweeted out, Pattinson is going to suck as Batman. Prove me wrong. Uh, and I just wanted to give you all an update on how that went. Now, I suck at Twitter. Let's just get that out of the way. I only have like a thousand followers or something. So I'm. Uh, it's not going to get like wide circulation. But you like, like the louder, you like the louder with crowd of uh, of movies, aren't you? You really are. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But anyway, I think I got more followers in 10 minutes after posting that than I have in the last 10 days. Like, I was like, no And you got you twice as many people followers. going, you're wrong. No, I'm just kidding. No, actually, no, no actually, actually no. I'm surprised. No, 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 no. Uh, I, I got the comments like, he sucked as Cedric Diggory, so why would Batman be different? And uh, most were like, yeah, we'll see, time will tell, and Benjamin Frimmel said, something, something, Heath Ledger. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, the first one to reply was actually Matt Jarbo, who said, we have to wait a long time for that to happen. 
And the one that gave uh, the most passionate defense was actually production H films, uh, which isn't necessarily Mr. H himself, but but rather his his production company. Uh, that that tw Twitter is run not by him. Uh, and the, here it says Pattinson will potentially be a different kind of Batman, young, undisciplined, more of a detective than a ninja. Uh, in my opinion, we can't judge him by a Keaton slash Bale standard. Will he be the best? No, but we haven't seen much of variation of Bat's character, and that should be given chance. So basically, I didn't see any very strong defense for him at all. Basically, uh, it was, it's too early to call. Uh, that's uh, <laughs> that's what uh, what uh, what the response seemed to be. So uh, I don't get all that much feverant defense of him. And you will him once it opens up a little bit. Like now, I'm sure, I'm sure, but I remain on. I did see a lot of people who were. I mean, I think there are obviously a, a bunch of people out there, you know, in myself, who are like he's, he'll always be the Twilight dude and the and the guy who was in uh, uh, you know Harry Potter. But there are a lot of people out there who, uh, you know, when I mention that, they're like, "Yeah, but did you see the lighthouse?" You know, and uh, you know, he's, you know, and with uh, and uh, Tenet, you know, like he's he's got more range and he's clearly starting to work his way up. So again, I'm always like, um, you know, it's like, uh, let's see, let's see what he's like and what he does with it. It really comes down to how Matt Reeves directs him. I mean, as an actor, you're kind of doing what they ask you to do and what's in the script, really. So if it's a good script and it's a good director, then uh, you know he'll do a good performance. So uh, hopefully. Yeah, ideally, ideally. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, again, uh, I'm I'm not sold on his casting. I think that Pattinson is a very good actor. I'm not disparaging him as an actor at all, and I can fully fully get over him. Uh, in in Twilight, I forgive him for that. Every actor has to start somewhere. Uh, but I have more issues with that movie than just than just him. Although I do like the car, the car is sweet. I would I, I would like that Batmobile for myself. Funny thing about the car, I just watched Blade two seconds ago, and uh, you know it's it's basically almost the same as you know Wesley's Blade's car, car. And Blade. Yep, <laughs> <laughs> I noticed some similarities too. <laughs> I think Matt Reeves has probably gone and looked at Norrington's movie and gone, uh, you know, that was a really cool kick-ass dark uh, superhero movie. Maybe you should be a bit blady, you know. So, Yeah. yeah Blade is, uh, 1998, that film still holds up as a very, very uh, well-made, uh, you know, superhero movie. It does indeed. Uh, Blade is uh, Blade is pretty good, and we just uh, we just learned that uh, Stephen Norrington was going to to direct Mutant Chronicles, and then oh. that fell apart, and that's how he ended up directing Blade instead. No, that, that is one, yeah. one of the revelations from our two-hour-long interview with uh, with Friedrich Malmberg. Who, by way of power, uh, by Cabinet Entertainment, is the owner of the entire Conan IP and Robert E. Howard estate. And for those of you that like the kind of content that we do here, go watch that interview. It's amazing industry insight. Plus, it gives full updates on Conan on Netflix and all of that jazz. Stephen so, was yeah. lined up. But Stephen was lined up after Blade as well. I mean. Um... For a while, he was doing The Crow, uh, worked a very long time on The Crow remake, um, and then Warburg came on board and he left at that point. And then also um, the Ghost Rider movie, he was uh, he was heavily involved in um, doing Ghost Rider. Him and Goya had worked on a script for, for months and months and months, and they were, um, you know, Stephen was locked onto that. I think Stephen's Ghost Rider would have been phenomenal. Um, so, yeah, there was a bunch of projects that Stephen was heavily involved in and got paid for as well, I think, on... Crow and Ghost Rider, he got a pretty decent ch uh, chunk of change as well for working on those and then being, uh, you know, and then walking away. Both projects that I think Norrington would have been uh, very cool on. I think it, some of the artwork and stuff we talked about for Crow, Crow was very cool. And his concept for Blade for a Ghost Rider was, he had some great ideas. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Uh, yeah, he's a great director. So it's a shame that he. Um... But he didn't get to do though, all of those movies. Mm -hmm. I think that in particular, Mutant Chronicles and Ghost Rider, uh, Rider would have been a whole heck of a lot better 
with him at the helm than the we, movies. Yeah, I was, I was talking to him on Mooton Chronicles. We were talking about that, and uh, I'd seen a bunch of stuff he'd done for that, and that was cool. And then later, after LXG, uh, Extraordinary Gentleman, he got a project called Lost Patrol, which we'd started production on, which was very cool. It was like crazy, like World War. It was like Overlord meets the thing, and it was really wild and off the page, and that was crazy, and that was cool. So uh, Stephen's a very uh, intelligent guy. He has some great ideas, and I think, it, you know, I hope he comes back and directs again, because whatever he does, he's... He definitely has a touch of call to everything he tends to get his finger on. And he's very um, amazing at being very contemporary of what he does. Got his finger on the pulse of what's kind of cool and in at the time. Yeah, absolutely. All right. With that, uh, I believe we are all caught up with uh, Super Chats and we are caught up with uh, most of the topics we wanted to uh, to discuss today. Uh, so the le the rest will just leave for for Wednesday. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank uh, Script Doctor for joining us. Of course, I'd like to thank Gary for joining us. Always a pleasure to have you on. My pleasure, absolutely. Cheers. Yes, and uh, everyone, uh, you should check back uh, in the in the next few days because we'll have another very cool video with Gary. So absolutely, <laughs> come back and uh, stay a look for that. Exciting announcements. Yeah. News about to drop. Yeah, uh, just I don't want to spill too much, but I will say that those that have been watching, you know, that Gary has been working on something. So uh, yeah, <laughs> it's going to be very cool. Be uh, and uh, and uh, also everyone in the chat, thanks for thanks for um, joining us. And Cellador uh, AU is evidently not uh, familiar with you with you, Gary. So. Uh, tell Celador, what's your full he name and what have you done? I'm kidding. <laughs> Rennie Harling used to call me Gary J. Tuna Fish. Hey, uh... <laughs> 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 Tuna Fish, have you done that thing? Mm. So my name is Gary J. Tunnicly, and uh, I've done all sorts of stuff. But I was known for gluing stuff on people's faces for a long time. Pinhead makeup and Hellraiser and all that kind of stuff. So, and then I've directed a couple of little things as well. But uh, yeah, Gary J. Tunnicliffe, look me up. Have a look up. There. Actually, we have a couple of interviews with the gentleman. They have a long interview. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, if you want to, if you want to look up Gary J. Tunnicliffe, then you start with uh, with our Hellraiser series. Uh, you yeah, start with that. What I would like to ask more than anything is that people who are watching this, uh, you know, they get a really good, crazy, stupid username uh, and log on because I just like hearing Andre have to say their name when he says Super Chat. So, like, I love hearing him say, Arrum, and, you know, I want to have, like, a name like, you know, I love sucking it, you know, like, you know. And I wonder what's inside your butthole. <laughs> Please, more people with crazy names so that Andre has to say them in his rich, luxuriant accent. It's always great to hear him say before every super chat, mm, he says, you know, with the tickle trunk, you know. Yeah, he said it right there. No, you have to say what Mr. Tickle Trunk just said, uh, uh, Andre, because it's two dollars. So please do the. Yeah, but I just did. Mm. No, but I actually, he wants you to give him the full treatment, though. Oh, the full. Okay, fine. Mr. Tickle Trunk <laughs> says for two Canadian dollars. Mm. <laughs> there you go. Now, now he feels yeah, complete. Want to thank everybody for joining us this morning. And yes, uh, he did some great work in Hellraiser. Uh, check it out for sure. We got some great interviews on that as well. So thank you, Sam. Do check them out. And uh, thank you again to Gary Tunnicliffe and also to Script Doctor for joining us. Uh, anything else to say, Andre, before we go? Yeah, no, the final thing that I would like to say is uh, again, check out our interview with Fredrik Malmberg. It's two hours long. So get some popcorn, get something nice to drink, and just enjoy because that's a blast. All right, till next time. Jeff, popcorn. 